Baltimore City Council Ways and Means Committee, we're back in session for Council Ordinance 23-0381, Ordinance of Estimates for the Fiscal Year Ending June 30, 2024. I'm Eric Costello, Councilman from the 11th District Chair of the Committee, joined to my left by Council President Nick Mosby, Councilman Chris Burnett, 8th District Member of the Committee. To my right, Councilman Mark Conway, 4th District, Councilman Isaac Itzi Schleifer, 5th District Member of the Committee, Councilwoman Felicia Porter, 10th District. To my immediate right is Marguerite Kern, staff to the committee. We're also joined by staff from Mayor Brandon Scott and Council President Nick Mosby's offices, respectively. A couple quick ground rules before we begin. We have this new technology in front of us. Uh, you will see two buttons. One of them looks like a little Lego character with a Wi-Fi symbol. When you're gonna speak, please press that button. The button will light up red. The ring up here will light up red. Microphone is on. When you're finished speaking, please turn your microphone off. These microphones are very sensitive. Uh, they will pick up breathing, sighing, whispering, anything like that. Uh, so please be sure to turn them off. You wanna be about this far away from the microphone uh, so that we can hear you clearly. We've also been joined by Councilwoman uh, Odette Ramos from the 14th District. Um, Director, how uh, many slides is your presentation? It's about eight to 10 slides, sir. Eight, how, how much time do you anticipate needing for your presentation? About 30 minutes. 30 minutes, okay. Um, okay. Um, I'm gonna ask you to try to squeeze it to 25 if, if you can. Um, 9.05 now. Um, director, before you get started, if you'd uh, say the first and last name uh, and position title of each of the members of your senior team that are up at the desk testifying. If anyone else has to testify who's not sitting at a desk, uh, they can either come up to one of these two desks or uh, come up to, to the lectern. Uh, take it away, Director. Good evening, Chair Costello, members of the committee, council members, attendees, and Baltimore City residents. My name is Shante Jackson, and I am the Executive Director of the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement. Thank you for being here with us, and to those tuning in online, thank you so much for joining us virtually. Before I begin, I would like to thank the entire team at Monsey, everything that we've accomplished on behalf of our city and the residents that call Baltimore home wouldn't have been possible without this dedicated, passionate group of public servants. So tonight I am joined by Chief of Staff Stephanie Mavronis, Gun Violence Prevention Associate Director Marcus Walker, Community Violence Intervention Deputy Director Crystal Miller, Group Violence Reduction Strategy Deputy Director Terrence Nash, Victim Services Associate Director Mark Mason, Intimate Partner Violence Deputy Director Wendy Lee, Anti-Human Trafficking and Sexual Assault Response Manager, Tom Stack. Policy and Research Associate Director, John Hoffman. Data Analytics Deputy Director, Joseph Mulhausen. Finance Associate Director, Brianne Young. Grants and Contracts Deputy Director, Alicia Sherrod. And last but certainly not least, our Communications Associate Director, Sydney Harpsupshire. We join you all tonight, all wearing orange, in recognition of Gun Violence Awareness Month. We'll move on to slide number two, please. So as we move from the Comprehensive Violence Prevention Plan's framing year into what we call our securing year, using ARPA dollars and city general funds, we built out our systems and staffing capacity necessary to both provide proof of concept and to transition our agency's pilot programs toward full implementation. As of this morning, this progress in collaboration with BPD and other safety partners has helped produce a 18.6% and a 17.8% reduction in homicides and non-fatal shootings respectively year over year. This is the largest year over year decrease since before the death of Freddie Gray. We're demonstrating what's possible when we work to develop a balance of data-driven, nationally proven, and innovative strategies and to bring them to scale to deliver sustainable public safety outcomes for all of Baltimore. 
And while we've made strides, I want to be clear in saying that this work is not going to be done until we stop losing Baltimoreans to violence. As someone whose family has been directly impacted by gun violence, as someone who's lost friends and neighbors and colleagues to the disease of gun violence, this work is personal to me. It's personal to many, if not all, of the people who make up our team. Despite the fact that I'm stepping down as the executive director of this agency in the coming weeks, I am confident in the progress we have made and that we'll continue to make in my absence. As an agency, Monsi is driven by the belief that any life lost to violence is one life too many in our city. The public servants who make up this agency take this work extremely seriously, and they feel the need from our communities to both enact immediate solutions to co-produce public safety and to build on the foundation that we've created to provide sustainable outcomes. At the end of the day, Monsi exists to serve Baltimore and to co-produce public safety in partnership with our fellow agencies, community-based organizations, and our city's residents. This work is not about me, it's about our city. And that's not gonna change regardless of who's involved and who's in charge of this agency. The foundation that we have built, the systems that we have built, and the team that this work has done and will continue to do will ensure that whomever takes over the role as director of this agency is able to leverage Monty's existing momentum in its service to Baltimore. Next slide. Maybe we're on this one. Over the past two and a half years, we've stood up a brand new agency that replaced and significantly broadened the scope of our predecessor agency, the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, in order to carry out Baltimore's comprehensive violence prevention plan. This work is both short-term and long-term, not one or the other. So when we think about where we are, before we talk about fiscal year 24, we wanna share some of the highlights that we've been able to accomplish in this past fiscal year. As a reminder, year one of the Comprehensive Violence Prevention Plan from July 21 to June 22 was our foundational year. That's where we focused on defining and staffing our work, building the infrastructure necessary to support the public health approach to violence, and forging those partnerships with local, state, and federal partners to ensure deep, meaningful collaboration. We're currently closing out what we call the framing year, where we've expanded the group violence reduction strategy from the Western District to the Southwestern District, with work well on the way to continue expansion to the Central District we're streamlining victim services. We've solidified our community violence intervention partnerships with CBOs and community-based partners. We began our re-entry efforts. We streamlined community-based funding protocols and established internal and external tracking tools to co-monitor our key performance indicators. So as we enter into what we call our securing year, which is July 23 to June 24, We'll be finalizing all of our proofs of concepts across our work. We'll be bringing the rest of the pilots to scale, including GBRS and the Eastern and the Southern Districts, sidestep, coordinated neighborhood stabilization responses, and neighborhood policing plans. And we'll also be conducting academic evaluations of those pilots. Additionally, we're gonna continue our work to grow and connect the efforts of our CVI ecosystem by establishing multi-year safe streets contracts for the first time and updating the comprehensive violence prevention plan to reflect lessons learned as required by the biennial uh, CVIP plan ordinance, which we're gonna be presenting to the, the council and the public in the coming months. So our agency now consists of about 45 dedicated public servant roles across six lanes of work. The gun violence prevention lane, which oversees the mayor's dual uh, integrated public safety strategies of community violence intervention and GVRS. The community engagement and opportunity lane, which leads our coordinated neighborhood stabilization response efforts and youth diversion, reentry, and Narcan and trauma-informed trainings outlined in the CVIP. Our victim services lane which includes our anti-human trafficking work, our intimate partner violence prevention, and the Baltimore City Visitation Center, 
and an integration of the Baltimore City Health Department's victim services team to Monsey. Our policy and research lane, which facilitates intergovernmental collaboration through the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council, as well as tracking and development of internal and external performance metrics and data sharing tools. Our communications lane is tasked with keeping Baltimore up to date on our agency's work across Monty social media accounts, press relations, and external reporting. And finance, which facilitates our grant awards to our community and our institution-based partners to help co-produce public safety and handles Monty's own grant applications to secure funding so that we can carry out our work on behalf of the city and the residents that call Baltimore home. Additionally, Monty's administrative team includes executive administrative functions, human resources, and community engagement work. As we think about, let's go back one slide, please. We're on service 617. Criminal justice coordination around victim services. As we've uh, transitioned to being the central hub for victim services at the local level, Monty's continued to implement intensive case management services and support to crime victims and their families. This calendar year alone so far, Monty has served 96 primary and secondary victims who have been affected by violence. Of those 96 victims, 13 were primary non-fatal gunshot victims. One was a primary victim of sexual assault. One was, or nine were primary victims of bullying. Three were primary victims of human trafficking. One was a primary victim of elder abuse. Four were primary victims of robbery, one primary of stalking and harassment, 28 were secondary survivors of homicide victims, 36 were secondary victims or family members affected. Two thirds of these victims are under the age of 24. That's 64 people under the age of 24 who for all intents and purposes are defined as victims who we provided support for. Since January of this year, Monty has assisted with 26 individuals, approximately across six to seven families who needed relocation services by directly providing funds towards security deposits, first month's rent, or subsidy to prevent eviction, totaling almost $59,000. When we think about intimate partner abuse, the Baltimore Child uh, um, Visitation Center uh, in 2023 has helped supervise visitation for 73 families without any altercations and assisted 100 young people and their families who were working to overcome domestic abuse. The Baltimore Child, I'm sorry, the Baltimore City Visitation Center also celebrated 10 years of service this year um, to Baltimore City. When we think about 911 diversion, we've completed a preliminary analysis of 911 call data, a landscape analysis including research on 911 call diversion efforts from across the country, and we've begun to engage stakeholders so that we can lay the initial groundwork for an interagency team. Based on this work, we have identified additional call types outside of behavioral health related calls as immediate candidates for alternative response and we're evaluating these call types to expand diversion beyond behavioral health calls. When we think about the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council, our CJCC meetings occur bi-monthly, our work groups meet monthly, um, we have had a, a very robust conversation again, uh, across these work groups, including the backlog of cases, domestic violence, fines and fees, pre-trial, public safety accountability, transportation, and warrants. Right now, the members of the CJCC are the state's attorney, the leader of the Office of the Public Defender, the USAO's office, the Baltimore Police Department, our sheriff, DJS, DPSCS, and parole and probation. When we think about data and the public safety accountability dashboard, for the first time ever, folks who live, work, and play in Baltimore have a clear view into what's happening in our city. They can follow along with our work to affect change for the better and to partner with us as we carry out the mayor's comprehensive violence prevention plan. This plan is going to be updated as with a second version in August of this year, and the additional data points are gonna include warrant information from the Office of the State's Attorney, gun seizures, intimate partner violence data, 
while also allowing residents to look at uh, data specific to their city council districts and their state legislative districts. When we think about group violence reduction strategy, we do produce internal weekly status reports on GVRS in the Western and the Southwestern District that covers all homicides and non-fatal shooting trends, participant engagement, and arrests. From a Safe Streets perspective, we produce quarterly reports that are available on Monsey's website on our reports and resources page that track data across our 10 sites, including non-fatal shootings, firearm homicides, violent crime, property crime, and mediations. From an intimate partner violence perspective in partnership with BPD, the state's, I'm sorry, the Sheriff's Office, the House of Ruth, Maryland, and the court system, we also track domestic violence incidents and disputes on a monthly basis. And last but certainly not least, as it relates to data, the CVI ecosystem map. So in partnership with the Mayor's Office of Performance and Innovation, we've developed an interactive map to demonstrate our prog progress toward growing and integrating our comprehensive ecosystem. And Baltimore can uh, see that on um, open Baltimore and really drill into the communities in which they live. For service 6, 18 uh, for GVRS. The status, the status in the Western District is that um, we've, been, we've been really grateful for the work that we've been able to do there since the beginning of the pilot last year in the Western District. Homicides and non-fatal shootings are down a combined 25.24%. We've connected 77 participants to services through YAP and ROCA. And with regard to the Southwestern engagement, since activating GVRS in the Southwestern District at the top of this year, homicides and non-fatal shootings are down a combined 22%, with 14 participants who've been connected to services through our partners. With regard to expansion into the Central District, I wanna remind folks that past iterations of Focus Deterrence, or GVRS, have failed by growing either too quickly or by not being intentional enough about making sure that we lay the groundwork needed to improve outcomes. It's why we're being really intentional about the expansion by making sure that our community partners have the resources that they need to provide those services, by building community relationships to identify those who are at risk, and by making sure the groundwork is in place to not just replicate the successes we've seen so far, but to sustain them. We have begun to lay the groundwork in the Central District. We've already started having meetings with community members. Uh, we are actively working on identifying community moral voice partners. And we've had one-on-ones with BPD command staff in the Central along with our technical advisors. We've already begun meetings with neighborhood association uh, uh, team members around education. We've already, uh, and in the coming weeks, we're going to be getting what we call historical reviews with BPD um, so that we can start to build out what's called a scorecard, um, which is equivalent to us assessing um, who are at the highest risk for either being a perpetrator or a victim of gun violence. And last but not least, want to remind uh, council members that it is our intention to continue this expansion into the eastern and southern districts by the end of the year. Um, northwestern and southeastern in Q1, Q2 of 2024, and lastly, the northern and northeastern by the end of Q2 of 2024. For the CVI ecosystem update, I won't spend too much time going into this, but I will say that over the past year, we've done a lot of work associated with understanding the risk factors associated with gun violence in our communities. In April of 2022, we outlined the long and short-term goals for expanding this ecosystem across a whole host of areas. Um, that included making sure that we were investing. Uh, and Mr. President, we, we heard you mention this on day one of hearings, um, the need to make sure that we're investing ARPA dollars and not just spending them and being really thoughtful about what Monty's investment of $7.3 million looked like um, in ways that were competitive and directly selected grants to organizations who are really doing the on the ground work and have been doing that for some time now. We've also awarded about $1.5 million to support hospital-based violence intervention programming in uh, eight hospitals across Baltimore City in fiscal year 23 across five medical systems. 
We rolled out our Safe Streets Baltimore Operations Manual to make sure that we had uh, some streamlined processes in place as we worked with the two strategic partners that now oversee that program. We began our hospital violence intervention program training for area hospital uh, administration and staff in partnership with the Javi. We'll continue to push out that work through technical assistance, um, through the coalition to advance public safety. And we're working obviously on longer term commitments around the use of our landscape analysis associated with violent crime data and our BPD top 30 uh, most violent posts to determine where CVI partners are needed to make sure that we strategically build the ecosystem. Last but certainly not least, we've mentioned to this body before the establishment of a formal school-based violence intervention partnership with Baltimore City Public Schools across three of our schools. I'm gonna advance to the next slide, please. As it relates to community empowerment and opportunity, um, as identified through Baltimore's Comprehensive Violence Prevention Plan, a trauma-informed approach to violence is one that we've also been taking through our coordinated neighborhood stabilization responses. In those responses, we mobilized city resources and community-based partners over a 45-day period to embed those critical, readily accessible resources and communities that experience acts of violence or other traumatic events, both proactively and reactively. Um, this response is informed by 211 data, 311 data, and 911 data to make sure that we're bringing the right resources into communities. And the five uh, activation criteria for responsive um, engagements involve mass shootings, youth-involved shootings, police-involved shootings, major law enforcement takedowns, and any uh, acts of accelerated violence that require a rapid response. To date, we have activated uh, this response 14 times. From a reentry perspective, updating you all on the returning citizens behind the wall initiative, this is the first time that Baltimore's directly developed solutions to remove barriers for reentry uh, by our residents. It's designed to connect Baltimoreans or folks who are returning to Baltimore who are about 18 months or so away from returning home. Um, in partnership with the Mayor's Office of Employment Development and the Department of uh, Rex and Parks. We are actively working uh, with 22 participants right now uh, in this initiative uh, collaboratively to develop a comprehensive recruitment and retention strategy as we scale. We're exploring permanent employment opportunities through employer partners and post-release engagements for participants. It's our ultimate goal to connect 500 returning citizens to employment every single year for the next two fiscal years as we bring the program up to scale. We'll also be announcing a reentry action council in the coming weeks. This board is going to really be working to coordinate government agencies and community-based organizations around a reentry continuum of care that's going to ensure seamless coordination for services for folks who are returning home that is meant to reduce the rate of recidivism in our city um, and to make sure that those folks have advocates. For service 758, this is the coordination of public safety strategy. This is our administration work. Uh, it is where finance lives. And as we think about grants, so far we've allocated a little over $30 million across 59 grant awards, 30 of which were direct selections, 29 were competitive. It is also the area where hiring and build out of staff capacity to carry out work happens. So in 2021, after the launch of the CVIP, Monsi had 12 team members. We've grown the agency to a staff of over 40, and we're actively working to hire qualified candidates for a couple of roles. The CVI outreach liaison, we've offered um, that position out. The Peace Mobile driver and outreach liaison, we're waiting for BOE approval on that. The reentry coordinator position is currently vacant. Our warrants analyst position, we've offered that position out. And our Safe Streets communication manager, we're awaiting for BOE approval. Director, so, pardon my interruption. Can you repeat the, I didn't quite hear it, the 39 and 50 
statistic or data point? Yes, was that? Uh, with regards to the grant award, sir? Y yeah, if you just repeat it, I'll, I'll hold questions till later. Yep, so, so far we've allocated over $30 million across 59 grant awards, 30 of which were direct selections and 29 were competitive. Thank you. So in closing, I want to again thank my fellow Monty employees and our senior leadership team for their dedication to this work. We are delivering results for our city and the data that we've shared this evening demonstrates the value that this agency brings to our city. Just want to reiterate a couple of results again. 96 victims serviced so far this calendar year. Seeing historical year-over-year -year declines, including this being the largest year-over-year -year decrease so far since before the death of Freddie Gray in police custody as it relates to homicides and non-fatal shootings. Want to thank the mayor for the integrated uh, strategies that are GVRS and CVI. GVRS homicides and non-fatal shootings are down 25.2% in the Western District since launch down 22% in the Southwestern since the top of the year. And Safe Street's violence interrupters have mediated 751 potentially violent conflicts this year alone. Approximately $30 million in investments in Baltimore's community-based organizations to support the folks on the ground who've always been doing this work. And so while it's with a heavy heart that I'm leaving this role, I know that the team that we have built, the structures we have put in place, and the partnerships that we have forged with local, regional, and national stakeholders will carry this work forward. The team is going to continue to remain focused on our goals to carry out the Comprehensive Violence Prevention Plan and work to ensure that Baltimoreans are able to live safe and alive and free I want to thank you all for listening. Uh, uh, Chair Costello, thank you. Um, honorable members of the committee and of the council, thank you for the opportunity to share this information with you all. And at this time, we welcome any questions that you might have about our agency or our work. Thank you, Director. Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have one quick question. I guess BBMR, real quick. Um, when you look at the breakdown of like the general funds to federal, state, special, obviously it's, um, overwhelming majority on like grant funds to the organization. I guess at this point, um, you know, the administration is committed to continuing to do this work when ARPA goes away uh, and then also the jeopardy of where we are from a federal perspective in, in grants like this. Um, how are we planning for the future to be able to properly project out uh, to continue to um, like, like, I, like, like the uh, director said, you know, constantly pushing this idea of, you know, let's invest the money, not spend the money, but ensuring that we can continue to see the residual effects uh, on these investments uh, in, the, in the future. Certainly. I think um, one of the things that the um, uh, administration and the, the, more te the mayor's office of recovery programs teams has really emphasized around the ARPA dollars in particular is making sure that we're doing evaluation on all these different strategies that we're trying so that we can really understand what's working and, what, and what's showing you know, positive impact and outcomes in our community. Um, one of the things that I think will be very important as we go into the wind down of ARPA in particular is to look at everywhere that we've been making investments with those ARPA dollars and to figure out where we're really seeing positive impact in our community so that we can be really strategic where we need to continue those investments because the reality is we won't be able to continue everything that we've been able to do with ARPA. But if we're able to sort of look at things holistically, we'll be able to make the most uh, strategic decisions. I think outside of ARPA dollars, one of the things that we're um, continually focused on with agencies and something that I'll be increasingly focused on as I, I move into my next budget with you all is really looking at our um, looking at agency grant awards and really understanding those grant awards in terms of what's stable and what's reoccurring and what's temporary and one time so that we can do a better job of talking, you know, of really understanding here are these reoccurring dollars that are, you know, we can depend on because of a formula, whatever the case may be. Um, and then again, we can be really thoughtful about how we leverage general fund dollars um, in these agency budgets that have a, that have a grant component. 
Thank you. Because um, I guess the, the concern is um, like, 14, uh, like 14 million out of 22 million is grant funds. So again, um, to your point, it's like, what are the goals? What are the objectives? What are the key performance indicators that we're tracking to ensure that one, we're staying on track to identify, you know, what's the low hanging fruit? Uh, where are we get our biggest bang for the buck? So that's the only thing I get concerned and get really scared when you look at the operating budget of something like Monty um, that is growing, 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 doing really good work, uh, but then also how can we ensure that we're gonna be able to sustain it in the future? And if not, what are the things that we're doing right now to ensure that again, uh, the things that we feel like are critical and are, are really important and needed uh, that we figure out a way to invest yeah. in the future? Yeah. I think that's Mr. Chair, thank you. Thank you. Uh, question for BBMR. Under service 617 and 618, there's an unallocated appropriation of 1.5 million and 2.5 million respectively. Can you advise as to what those are? Those are anticipated grant awards, um, either uh, state or federal, um, where they, um, you know, they're not necessarily tied to a specific grant, but they're um, they're tied to anticipated f funding that we would receive uh, post adoption of the 24 budget. Got it. And the positions total under Monsey, we've got 21 positions. Mm -hmm. How many yes. positions are in that? in the agency? So there's 21 positions total in, Mon in, the, agent, in the Monzi budget overall. Um, and then if they're spread, if you look at page um, 156 of the budget book. I'm sorry, let me, let me ask the question a different way. Last year, at one point, there were 33 employees at Monzi, correct? Oh, um, the count that you're seeing in the budget document would not include any ARPA funded positions. So the 33 would have included uh, the portion of the um, of Monzi's po uh, position count that um, are ARPA funded. Do we do that for all agencies that have ARPA funded positions? Yes, and that is tied back to the decision that was made to fully appropriate the ARPA award in that one single budget. Um, we, so in order to prevent double appropriating the ARPA dollars, we have to, um, all of the ARPA funded positions live in the budget as a, a salary saved position. Are the salary saved positions noted anywhere in the budget book? Um, they, they are not, but that would be, that would be a, um, information that I could provide to the committee as a follow up. Can you tell me how many positions there are currently at Monty between the 21 and the ARPA funded positions? Um, I can if you give me just... Uh, Absolutely. Yes, one second. Take your time. Mr. Chair, we have 20 funded ARPA positions. So you have a total of 41 positions, 21 funded by general fund and federal f funding and then an additional 20 funded by ARPA? And then an additional four. As I mentioned um, earlier, we have 45 positions. A okay. couple of those have not been uh, approved through BOE yet, but they have also, they're grant funded positions that have been uh, awarded either at the state or federal <clears throat> level. Okay, so those additional four are not reflected in the book because they haven't been awarded yet. Correct. Right, but they're anticipated. Yes, sir. Got it. What's the, what is gonna be the apex of the total number of employees at Monsey? What is the, the what's the sweet spot? Because the, the office has grown exponentially over the last two years and I'm wondering when do we hit the sweet spot? Thank you for your question, I appreciate that. Um, I would offer that given the expanded and deepened scope of the agency when compared to its predecessor agency, the work required, um, the level of growth that we are seeing now, um, the, uh, the team and I have delivered to uh, the mayor um, what we believe um, the, the funding diversification spread and the staffing model would need to look like year over year through fiscal year 26, um, which takes us through the completion of um, the first version of the Comprehensive Violence Prevention Plan and happy to defer to the Chief Administrative Officer with regard to um, 
what the what the apex will look like. Thank you. Thank you for that question, sir. Um, I concur with the director that um, I think the growth that we are seeing in the organization um, is because a number of the services that we're bringing um, uh, or that we are delivering through the organization. So the director talked about how we are now centralizing some things like victim services, um, which were spread across the city and we're trying to centralize them in one key location. And so that's also gonna require that we, um, that we bring additional staff to support the work um, very similarly, the work that we're doing around returning citizens, for example. Um, so given the expansion of the work from the predecessor agency, I think you know where we are now with the organization, and, and especially because um, we are bringing in additional resources to support these positions, um, that they are delivering on the mandate of the office. I can't say um, the maximum amount, but I think where we are now with the agency, is a, it's a sweet spot. I think the team is actively delivering on the mandate and the work in front of them. Um, and if we need to expand, I think we will you know, evaluate the need to expand beyond what we're doing now. But again, I think the team over the past year, uh, couple of years or two years is now in a position to deliver on the, an array of services um, that they're currently delivering on. Thank you for the response, CA Leach. Um, can you provide a specific response as to what Monty has proposed to the mayor and his team would be the, the full build out by fiscal 26, what that number of staff is? Sure, um, I will have to go back to see uh, that there is a document that suggests any specific number. So I'll go back and determine. Okay, is that document uh, something that can be provided to the committee? I will go back and, and check to see what document might outline that type of information. Got it, thank you so much. Nate, got that? Thank you. We're gonna to go to Councilman Burnett and then Councilman Schleifer. I just wanna thank you for your service, Director, um, and your leadership in transforming this office. Uh, it looks entirely and is operating at a, a greater capacity than I could have ever thought uh, when I first came into the city council and the office is more like a sort of a place to get data on crime and sort of that was really about it. Um, and so just thankful for you and your team and the hard work that you all have done in building this out. Um, I, I would also could not sit here uh, and I thank the work, especially the emphasis on human trafficking work under uh, leadership of my co-chair Tom Stack in the back. Um, so just thank you uh, for that. Um, part of my question was actually literally just thrown out, um, the uh, capacity for expansion, particularly around victim services and GBRS. Um, so I guess we'll wait for the document to, about like, just I guess the continued staffing, what that should look like. It doesn't sound like maybe you have those numbers offhand, it doesn't sound like we do at the moment. Um, so I guess it would be helpful. The, 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 the growth plan, it doesn't sound like there is like one single document, but I was just particularly interested in GVRS and victim services as far as what the staffing needs to be to really operate that at full capacity. Uh, GVRS probably is a little bit more straightforward because you, you know how many you need in each district perhaps. Victim services maybe not so much, but I'll let you respond. Thank you for your question, sir. Um, so I'll uh, reiterate again uh, what I spoke about during uh, our, my opening remarks that um, Monty is now joined by the Baltimore City Health Department's victim services team. And so that merger has happened um, in ways that afford us the opportunity to streamline some processes, um, to reach out to more victims than ever before, and to remove confusion um, from the general public with regard to which agency you go to, which, which uh, agency is the hub for the provision of victim services. We continue to work really closely with the Baltimore Police Department and their victim services unit, as well as the state's attorney's office and their victim services team, um, and look forward to uh, sharing with you all what um, the, the expansion of the victim services work will continue to look like. Uh, with regard to the group violence reduction strategy, yes, we're in active discussions with the chief administrative officer and with the mayor with regard to what expansion will need to look like in order to stay uh, on track as we move this across the entirety of the city. Um, and I am really optimistic about what that means uh, we'll be able to do to continue to, to drive the numbers down. 
Yeah, I think particularly on that front, um, you answered my sort of the question around like the state's attorney's office, police department. So it sounds like those conversations are focused on keeping their victim services in place, or is this a conversation around sort of the, con the sort of larger consolidation in the same way that you've seen me already consolidated between the health department and Imanzi? So I would um, remind members of the committee uh, that we are still working diligently to uh, make sure that we're stepping through the assessment associated with the PSP victim services report that came out uh, well over a year ago now and doing that in a very coordinated way, quite frankly, um, um, in ways that we haven't been able to do in the past because of the sheer um, volume of partners that needed to be involved from community-based partners to agency partners. And so we haven't yet uh, determined um, what a, a consolidation would potentially look like. What we are working through right now is what does the integration of our work look like that leaves Monsi serving as the centralized hub for victim services and making sure that we are directing um, those that we're providing supports to to the appropriate agency. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening. So uh, we were talking about year over year reductions on crime. So now that we're halfway through the year, do you have an anticipated reduction? of what you're, you're planning to see on the homicide rate? Thank you for your question, council member. I think in the, the opening remarks, we did um, share with the committee that where we are right now is at 18.6% uh, year over year reduction in homicides and a 7.8% a year over year reduction in non-fatal shootings. And I wanna say again, um, not just for the committee, but for Baltimoreans, we've never seen this percentage of, of, of decrease um, since before the death of Freddie Gray in police custody. And so we are breaking years long records. This number is as of 531. Um, and in having discussions with the Baltimore Police Department, they've confirmed with our data team um, that not um, prior to, to 2015 have we seen numbers track this well. Um, I, I will answer the question in the same way that I answered it last year. Um, I think that it would be imprudent of me to project what the final number would be at the end of the year. And at the same time, we are working relentlessly in partnership with anybody and everybody that wants to partner with us to drive down our violence numbers um, in ways that are demonstrable um, to date and will continue to be. No, I appreciate that. And so uh, on that note, so how are you, how is like the impact of crime uh, reduction being measured, especially as it pertains to the ARPA dollars? So each of our ARPA uh, uh, grant recipients has performance measures. We have delivered those to this body in this 151-page memo that Monty delivered to this committee uh, last week. Um, and that documentation includes the performance measures that we are using to make sure that we're holding folks accountable so that any subsequent funding um, that we do release to folks is rooted in results-based accountability. Um, I, I, I would offer that that's the answer. Um, there are specific performance measures based on um, the type of grant that we've issued, whether it's a community violence intervention grant, a victim services grant, a youth justice grant, but each of our grant recipients have performance measures that they um, have to align with and they are uh, required to provide quarterly reporting to the agency. Okay, thank you. So, I mean, I was like looking a little bit more like high level in terms of, you know, you're talking about the, this money being invested. And so in thinking about what the return on investment looks like, you know, each individual group, and, and I read those reports, so thank you for sending them, uh, but each individual group is not, you know, can't solely be responsible. So even if each one is performing overall the overarching strategy, uh, that's what I'm looking to just learn a little bit more about. Uh, based on the sum of all these parts, what should we, how should we measure 
the return on investment? How do we look in next year or year after? Uh, do we determine if this is being successful or not? Because as uh, the chairman and the president were saying before, you know, in, in two years when that money runs out, there needs to, we need to decide, is that something that we continue to uh, invest in? So what does that overarching return on investment look like? I would offer that your question is a multifaceted one, um, and, and I appreciate the ask. Um, the mayor has been extremely clear with regard to his goal of a reduction of 15% of homicides and 15% of non-fatal shootings in our city, and that is probably the key measure for success across the entirety of the Comprehensive Violence Prevention Plan. But I wanna make sure that I remind this body that there are also other desired outcomes and impacts associated with this plan. That we are truly improving the life outcomes of folks by reducing recidivism rates. Um, for our GVRS participants, for example, we've only seen a recidivism rate of 11%. Um, we are uh, taking our job very seriously with regard to keeping people safe, alive, and free. We're, keeping, we're taking our job very seriously to make sure that we're providing victims and not just uh, primary victims, but secondary and tertiary victims, the level of supports that they need so that they are not re-victimized, um, but also so that they don't become victimizers, right, or perpetrators of um, victimization. And so that high level, level number um, connects back to what the mayor um, has stated is the overarching goal. There are underlying goals that I would um, ask this body to consider in two years to determine which programs uh, make sense to continue to fund and which ones don't, and Monty would be doing the exact same evaluation. In fact, I personally had conversations with community-based organizations who've expressed interest in subsequent funding and have said to them, let's take a look at what your quarterly performance numbers and your outcomes and impacts look like. Okay, so, no, so I appreciate that. So if I understand correctly, now that we're seeing reductions going on and we're starting to see some of the fruits of the labor that you're mentioning. So is this year like the first year we should expect to see that 15% reduction? What I will say there is what I said a few questions ago. Um, the mayor's goal of 15% reductions of uh, homicides and non-fatal shootings has been our goal post from the very beginning. That is a goal that we are going to continue to work relentlessly and tirelessly toward. Um, and the numbers as we see them right now through 531 are promising. Okay, thank you. Conway and Porter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Director. Uh, uh, actually, my, my first question um, is actually to a CAO um, and, and, and thinking about how important the work that this office is doing, um, of course, thinking about leadership for the office. Do we have a sense of the timeline for uh, replacement and either uh, a decision or some leanings toward an interim until we do fill the position? Thank you for the question. Um, I actually hope to have um, a uh, replacement or a new director in place, um, hopefully within 60 days. And an interim? We will name an interim. Thank you. Thank you. Torrance Ramos. Good evening, Director. Um, my line of question is going to go back to GVRS because intimately I have most of the Western District, so I've seen the reductions. My question related to GVRS, in, which is kind of hard because knowing the stories that I've seen from people who have entered as participants and then seeing the actual data, my question is now that the Western District will now be a part of redistricting, how are we going to coordinate as this pallet expands? 
Thank you for your question. Uh, this is something that we've been talking about for some time now since uh, uh, we decided that we were going to be redistricting across the entirety of the city, having not done it in well over five decades. Um, the Western District, based on our redistricting uh, projections, will account for about 14% of um, the um, gun violence distribution across our city. As we um, uh, combine the Western District, the uh, Southwestern District, and the Central District and scale up, that means that we go from accounting for 14% of uh, the group violence distribution across our city to what will become a projected um, 39 to 40% projection. And then as we spread into uh, the other two districts, the Eastern and the Southern respectively, covering about 64% of the city's projected um, distribution of violence. This is based on what those violence distribution rates looked like in October of last year as we were stepping through the conversations around redistricting. Uh, we uh, work closely with the Baltimore Police Department and they are uh, well on their way to getting us uh, closer to that redistricting, uh, including the resectoring being completed in the coming weeks. Thank you, Director. Uh, so I just wanna highlight something in questioning related to how this is different than traditional policing. Um, I would like to highlight a story related to the CBT, the cognitive behavioral therapy, because what I've found from hearing the stories of participants is that we're changing participants' mindset. And can you speak to the services that help them with changing their mindset? Yeah, I think that this would be an opportune time for Baltimoreans to hear directly from the deputy director of the group violence reduction strategy to answer that question. Um, because as the executive director, I don't do this work alone. Um, and I, I think that Mr. Nash would probably be more appropriate to, to share uh, the impacts of cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, that one? Is that it? Hi, Terrence Nash. I'm the Deputy Director for the Group Violence Reduction Strategy. And sorry, I was looking at my notes. Could you repeat the question? So can we highlight how CBT has changed uh, participants' mindsets and what type of services that we offer with CBT? Absolutely. Thank you very much for the question. So just to start with, out of the 88 individuals that have, are receiving services, 60 uh, are actually getting CBT. Uh, as you've heard, we've seen an 11% um, recidivism rate. Uh, and actually, that rate is out of the Western District. When you look at the total, we're looking at 7% recidivism. If you remember from the first hearing, uh, our goal was 25%. So what we're seeing is that we're seeing individuals that are at the highest risk of shooting somebody or being shot, having a lowering percentage of recidivism that we've seen in other um, cities that have done focused deterrence. And just anecdotally, bless you, um, I've seen the young men and women. Um, I've visited YAP. I've talked to individuals. And I've known some of the individuals from our previous life, and now seeing them, they're completely different people. Thank you, Mr. Nash, because I'm joined to a story of one participant who did not commit domestic violence because he had a life coach to talk to, right? So I think about the violence that's being prevented because persons are now thinking differently about before they're acting. So my next line of questioning in terms of this pilot and this is one of the hardest ones, is sustainability over time, because I know that we have it in the Southwestern now, and then we'll be moving to other districts. The, how are we pre, how are we teaming up for the next districts? Because this is intentional work that they have to learn. So as we go into the districts, the most, uh, one of the most important things uh, are service providers hired by zip code, so that they make sure that uh, the individuals that are performing the life coaching are familiar with the immediate neighborhoods and the immediate uh, complications of some of the uh, more violent neighborhoods. Uh, 
they are getting training, of course. They get trained. Um, uh, Yap was trained by Roca. Of course, Roca has a national reputation for CBT training. Um, so that training continues, and we are constantly working with our TAs. I meet with our TAs once a week. Uh, well, now once every uh, two weeks. Uh, those are our technical advisors through the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, one of our technical advisors, uh, David Muhammad, is uh, renowned in this work, and he's constantly checking in with our service providers to make sure that they're getting the level of support they need and the training they need so that they can give that support to our uh, participants. Thank you, Mr. Nash, and my final question, because this is the hardest one that we had to answer with communities moving into the Western District and those leaving, and what focus deterrence is the displacement of violence. Have we seen any displacement of violence? No. Uh, there was, uh, University of Pennsylvania did a report on displacement, and they found no evidence of displacement after doing uh, four different type of analyses. And that is true of all the four surrounding police districts to the western and southwestern? I'm sorry? And that is true for all the districts surrounding the southwestern and the western district? That is true for the western district. We'll do a similar uh, analysis for southwestern. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Council Member, what, what I would add to uh, what we just heard from Terrence ar around this um, displacement analyses that was completed by the University of Pennsylvania and where members of this committee along with Baltimoreans can find on our website is um, not only did we look at the review of subsequent arrests for GBRS referrals, but we also looked at, um, we did a focus group with BPD intelligence and proactive enforcement officers on group behaviors. We reviewed the homicide and the shooting incidents in neighboring districts. And we reviewed the changes in the NIBIN matches between 2021 and 22, that's the ballistics matches, um, to see if we had connectivity to groups that were engaged in violence in the Western District. And our um, third party technical advisors, who as Mr. Nash mentioned, are nationally renowned, um, indicated that there is no um, presence of spatial displacement as a result of the work that we are doing on GBRS in Baltimore City. Thank you. Um, I just have a question, um, really a comment. So just from my experience with dealing with the pilot, I've seen a culture shift in West Baltimore where persons are willing to not only enter into the services, but they're willing to provide active intelligence in actual crimes. So that this is both not only in on the individual level, but from a holistic level, we are finding that people are trusting our police enforcement again, as well as our prosecutions, as well as trusting that the city will provide them the services. And that is absolutely one of the benefits of the group violence reduction strategy because you're leveraging community moral voice um, and you're leading with opportunities to uh, take advantage of services and resources. We're seeing a deepening of the relationship that our community members have with the um, GBRS team, both at Monsey and the outreach team at BPD. And so folks have been more willing to have conversations about um, criminal activity that's happening in their neighborhoods. Um, Monsey, and I mentioned this in a previous hearing, um, is really grateful for this partnership because it's allowed us to assist with BPD's clearance rates. Thank you, I yield back. Thank you. I, I appreciate the question that the councilman had because um, this is sort of something that I um, haven't been able to wrap my head around. And I remember we had a conversation in committee about it in particular. Um, the question of displacement um, versus resource pull. Um, and essentially the question that I, I had then um, and I still have now and I wonder if we've had any more ability to answer that question is um, does the program's intensive resource pull on the police department have any impact on other districts' ability to respond and to anticipate and to interact with criminal activity in their districts? Uh, most notably because um, we did see significant decreases in violence in the western, the southwestern, and the surrounding areas. Um, but we saw very significant increases in the northeastern district and the southeastern district over the last couple of years. And I, I, I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. I'm, I'm really curious if um, we've thought about that as a team since that hearing, uh, and if we have any, any better sense of the resource pull for running the operation. 
Thank you for your question. Um, I'll, I'll start with an answer here, but obviously would defer to um, the police commissioner tomorrow um, to supplement uh, my answer. Um, the, the beauty of the group violence reduction strategy is that um, it benefits surrounding neighborhoods through what's called a diffusion of benefits because groups tend to be hyper localized in the neighborhoods in which they exist. Um, us reducing violence in the Western District, for example, um, many of you may recall we did a takedown of Poe Homes and Princess Plaza just a few months ago, um, would not uh, result in us seeing an uptick in violence in the Northeastern District because folks are not leaving Poe Homes, if you will, and going from West Baltimore all the way over to Northeast Baltimore to, um, to set up shop. So your question specifically around mm -hmm. BPD resources, because we took their capacity into consideration, um, we focused right now not only on areas that have the highest level of group violence, but also areas that have BPD capacity through their district action teams. And so leveraging those um, districts that have more than one DAT has afforded us the opportunity to not tap into another district's uh, resources in uh, focusing on that work. Uh, and I, we may have to get into this in a little more detail tomorrow, but um, I think it's particularly that issue. So when looking at the Northeast, for instance, we've seen a significant rise in crime last year and this year and a rise in crime after, you know, like an 80% increase in crime from last year. Um, and one of the notable pieces was that the Northeast District historically has had two DAT teams and is now reduced to one DAT team. Um, we know that um, the, the district changes, the redistricting will make that right. So it will, it's yet to see whether or not um, that reduction in DAT teams um, will be appropriate for, for the new size of the Northeastern District, but I do have still some unanswered questions about whether or not the reduction in specialized forces of sorts for the North Northeastern District has resulted in a lot of the increases in crime that we've seen in the district. The, the um, I guess the point that I would make there, given the connection to the GVRS portion of your question, is that the reduction of any debts outside of a group violence reduction um, district doesn't have a direct connection into the group violence reduction strategy because those those that teams haven't been moved from one district into another. The districts that we are in right now already have two DATs. Um, and so uh, while your question is a valid one, I would offer it probably makes more sense for the police commissioner to answer the question with regards to the reduction of the Northeastern um, DAT count and um, any um, um, anything, any activity resulting from that decision. Uh, yeah, I'll close here. Um, I, 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 I agree. I think um, only the re really the commissioner can speak knowledgeably about those issues. I think um, one of the things we'll have to consider as a city, of course, once uh, ARPA goes away and uh, we're thinking about what sustaining this program looks like is what those additional resource pulls mean on our overall operations. So I think um, uh, and, you know, I, I, the program seems to be showing results. She seems to be working as uh, we expected, and I've said this from day one, um, but in thinking almost scientifically about the impact that the decision to support the program has on other districts or other programs based on police police's ability to, you know, show up um, and show out. So I think that's something we'll need to think about, and, I, you know, this team, Monty, will have to think about the in, in partnership with the police department. Agreed, yes, sir. That will absolutely have to consider that. Um, I, I think that it's worth mentioning that we'll need to consider that along um, with uh, this expansion, this gradual expansion, where we're covering districts through the redistricting, where we're seeing uh, the most gun violence play out and seeing the reductions of gun violence in those districts um, have an impact on BPD's capacity as well. Got it, thank you. Um, I'll pass off to Councilman Ramos. Uh, thank you, um, just as a quick follow up there, I just wanna acknowledge that Eastern District um, has reduced homicides in Eastern District and non-fatal shootings 
<coughs> they do not have GVRS, but they have reduced it by 45%. That's really amazing. And what that tells me is two things. One is, because I know Major Thacker and I know what they're doing there, they're actually getting ready for GVRS. They're already doing the work that the police should be doing to get ready for GVRS. He's actually seeking out the resources to make this happen as well. So he's, he's ready. Um, and so I don't, I just, just because, I, and I realize that Northeast District is having some um, challenges, um, but I don't think that it's a resource pool issue. I really think that it's, in, at least in Eastern, they're getting ready for this. They believe in the strategy. Um, and they're, they're working towards it already um, and trying to figure out the best way um, to continue to get trust of the community. Um, so it, this whole strategy, it seems to me, um, uh, Madam Executive Director, has really been about the shift in mindset around um, how we are addressing um, reducing violence. Um, and so as we're thinking about, and this leads to my question, as we're thinking about um, sustainability, it also seems to me not only that we continue to provide the resources, but as you said earlier, it seems like we're also integrating and creating a whole different way of doing this work that eventually will be integrated into our systems so that this initial investment has been critical to, for us to get there it may not need as much money later, or maybe it does, depending on how we're doing, um, but at least that we're actually trying to build this foundation and this work so that the, um, it never goes away, period. We're gonna go ebbs and flows, right, in terms of the stats. Uh, hopefully not, right? We're hopefully to get that downward trend. But I guess what this is telling me, because Eastern District that does not have GVRS yet, and hopefully it will, even though the stats are down, it <laughs> Um, that uh, that, they're, that the whole mindset has been shifting, and I think that's extremely important. Um, but I, I do believe that we need to continue to bring in the resources and to have the resources for, for people who are just not wanting to be a part of, you know, what's happening here. So I guess if you can comment a little bit more about the sort of stability of the work and the resources needed or how we're trying to integrate, because 2026 is tomorrow, right? It's tomorrow. I mean, it's just, it is. So, uh, and we want to really think long term. Thank you for your question. Um, I would offer that um, we are really excited about the work that's been happening in the Eastern District. Um, members of the command staff there were a part of the GVU. And so while GVRS isn't fully implemented there yet, they did take what they learned, right? Um, with regard to conducting violence reviews, with regard to deepening relationships with community, um, doing outreach in unique ways um, that prepare them for us moving into the Eastern District. It is still very much our intention to follow the sequence um, that the mayor laid out some time ago, um, because decisions can't just be made based on a blip. Um, there is a reason why our technical advisors and our partners across multiple agencies looked at data over a five-year period. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't be responsive to trends that we're seeing emerge, and at the same time, um, those of us who are data geeks um, understand um, what um, statistical inference really needs to drive us to um, and not necessarily depending on a blip um, in time. With regard to uh, BPD kind of adopting this work, the police commissioner and I talk about this often along with the technical advisor and other members of the GVRS team. This, this is um, an operational change for, GV, uh, for BPD and is something that the entire rank and file have to embrace. Um, I would offer that that's been the charge from Mayor Scott. It's been the charge from the, um, the public safety team uh, with regard to the work and we're, we're well on our way. Um, when GVRS works well, um, it doesn't, when GVRS works well across the city, it is not purely a reaction to violence that's happening. There's also proactivity associated with the work around how we see officers engage, but also how we see folks who um, have potentially been um, 
close to violence in their lives, making intentional decisions about walking away from that. And we have seen that in this last year across ROCA and YAP, that not everyone is referred um, through this process, but because of the credibility um, that these service providers have and the, um, the stories like Kiko's story um, that we told just a few months ago, folks are walking in the door at ROCA and YAP and saying, you all offer services. I'm, I'm tired of standing on the corner. I want to do something different. Um, and we're excited about that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Madam Director. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to back clean up in these hearings and appreciate all of your service. Genuinely, truly do. Um, want to first uh, uplift and thank you for the very trauma responsive and trauma informed approach that I think your office has taken. I was excited to see the Peace Mobile come to Baltimore. It's, um, you know, the more we can do to promote peace instead of just anti-violence, I think is important. Um, one of my concerns, and I do appreciate the gains we've been making with GVRS, um, but there's a population that I do not think has been um, introduced or impacted by the intervention as of yet, uh, which is our relatively new immigrant community where we're seeing a pretty high uptick in violence, um, both uh, sort of within in, in, intra-community violence and then um, external as well, um, both and, and sort of on both sides of the gun. Um, I had a good conversation with Roca not too long ago, um, but they don't have many Spanish-speaking staff as of yet, um, and, and that is a concern. And I think that as a city, if we do not proactively get ahead of um, the potential for folks to come here without resources, without a family network, without a community network, and find themselves ensconced in violence, um, we'll see it. That's been the trend in a lot of cities, and I, I fear it could be the trend in Baltimore. And in the same breath, I want to say that our immigrant community is a tremendous blessing to our city and has contributed to the vibrance of my district and South Baltimore and um, really all over the place. But I, I worry that we're at a bit of a tipping point and that I haven't heard much within sort of the Monsi framework to specifically address our new arrival community. So I'm wondering if um, there is a piece of this, because I know that GVRS is coming relatively soon to South Baltimore, but not for a while to Southeast Baltimore. So I am wondering if there is a piece of this where we can specifically address that community, because I think it's, uh, like I said, at a, at a bit of a tipping point right now. Thank you for your question. Um, I, I would uh, remind members of a conversation that we had just a few weeks ago uh, related to uh, Monty being in the process of partnering with the Mayor's Office of Multicultural Affairs with regard to um, printing um, its collateral in Spanish and in addition to uh, Spanish into three other languages, but uh, Spanish being our primary language here, so that we are able to mobilize um, for our Spanish-speaking residents. In addition to that, in response to um, um, the, the tragic murder of Isaiah over at Patterson High School, we did mobilize to that school in partnership with Baltimore City Public Schools, um, in partnership with a whole host of um, community-based organizations. And we made sure that we had someone who was bilingual so that we were conducting those conversations, those interventions, and those assemblies. Um, in both English and in Spanish as we engage with those young people and engage with their family members. We also partnered with um, community-based organizations that are led by um, uh, folks who have immigrated to our country, um, and so really uh, appreciate that partnership there. And we've got more work to do. Um, so I would say that over the coming months, uh, we will make sure that we are engaged in more meaningful ways uh, with regard to the education 
of what the group violence reduction strategy is for that population, um, but also through our, our school-based programming on the community violence intervention side, we're going to be entering into three high schools that have um, a level of diversity across those three schools that is going to require us to um, be really thoughtful about what language access uh, looks like so that we're, we're reaching um, folks in ways that feel unique and authentic to them. No, I appreciate that. And again, you know, I appreciate partnership with MEMA and uh, other entities. I just think we have to go deeper, um, you know, just like any community uh, in our city, we just have to make sure that we are engaging effectively with the credible messengers, um, the folks like Lucia Islas who runs Comité Latina and does so much in our communities. Uh, there are just so many folks who are kind of on the ground leading the work and I don't know if they would say they feel connected yet to the Monsi strategy, um, but I think that they absolutely need to be. I did want to ask in the same kind of line about the school-based interventions. Um, I unfortunately did not see Patterson on that list, but I do wonder, um, I, I appreciate the sort of push in that you all have done um, after the murder of Isaiah and other folks um, outside of our high schools, um, but just the sustainability of those interventions. Um, you know, I think what our kids often see is like adults flood the zone when there's an act of violence and then they leave. And as we know, the trust is really important and developing long-term relationships is really important. And so I wonder about both sort of the sustainability of those school-based interventions and how it becomes not just like us reacting and responding when a horrific incident occurs, but actually like building those relationships long-term because I think that's what our kids need. And then also just, again, linking into existing infrastructure around restorative practices, around the student wholeness framework that exists within city schools, like how are we plugging into those? Yeah, thank you for your question. Um, so Patterson is not on the list of schools that will be a part of the initial uh, school-based violence intervention pilot. Those three schools are Mervo, Carver, and Digital Harbor um, across a two-year period given some funding that Monsey, uh, uh received from the National League of Cities. And at the same time, Monsey is charged with making sure that we're being responsive um, in a trauma-informed way to our community when our communities need it. And so whether um, a part of the school-based programming um, pilot or not, uh, we would be doing our city a disservice if we didn't respond to um, Benjamin Franklin and didn't respond to Patterson and didn't respond to Edmondson and, and the whole host of other schools that we've responded to um, this year. To your point around making sure that we don't just helicopter in and leave, um, we're very intentional about the partnerships that we create when we go into those schools. And so THREAD is a community-based organization that is in um, Patterson High School. And so making a connection with Casey to understand what the work looked like for um, both the English speaking and the English as second language um, speaking population there. Um, asking additional questions of the community engagement office at Baltimore City Public Schools around what that looks like and even providing some recommendations based on what we saw when we were in the school um, is a part of the work. I would offer that in this way, Monty serves as the coordinator of um, bringing community-based organizations, city agencies, state agencies, other quasi-agencies together to deliver services because we are not the direct service provider for everything. Um, we are intentionally an agency that is meant to provide um, direct services as an ancillary support to community-based organizations while providing community-based organizations with the capacity, the funding, the supports that they need in order to self-sustain. I appreciate that. Um, thank you, Direct Director Jackson. Thank you, Councilman. Um, this is for the budget director. Um, can you tell me what the salary is for the director position at Monsey, please, currently?
Um, the the current salary is uh, just over two hundred and twenty three thousand. And the reason it's listed as about two hundred eight in the book is because the book was developed before. At the time the book was developed, uh, the salary was two hundred eight, right, or two hundred two. That's correct. We pulled the the salaries at a point in time in the budget planning process. Um, and and we don't refresh them throughout the planning process. Do you know what the position started at in this administration? Um, I, I I want to verify that um, I believe that the the starting salary for this position was uh, 195. Thank you. Um, the second question has to do with uh, GVRS, um, specifically with respect to. <clears throat> the Western District. Is anyone able to talk about the level of BPD resources, specifically GVU, that were deployed on top of whatever the uh, patrol constant is that exists in the Western District? Deputy Director Nash can speak to that directly. Um, also happy to provide the historical counts as we stepped into 2022 to launch um, compared to uh, where we are today. Uh, but Deputy Director, when you're ready. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, GVU has um, currently uh, three investigative units, one intelligence unit, one outreach unit, along with uh, administrative. How many total FTEs is that in terms of sworn officers? I believe that that would be 6, 12. Um, they're understaffed. They're missing an investigative unit just because they're short staffed like the rest of BPD. Um, but I believe it's um, close to 30. Well, you would probably want to ask the police commissioner. If it's slightly over 30, but you can ask him. Even now. It was on my list for tomorrow, but th it thank you, Assistant Director. I appreciate it. So uh, well, one quick follow-up to that, and then I'll pass it on to Councilman Schleifer. So w when thinking about uh, what the constant is in the Western for patrol and then other uh, traditional sworn BPD resources notwithstanding GVU that would be deployed to the Western, um, what was the strategy for turning to other local, state, and federal agencies um, to fill gaps in enforcement? So uh, we have a couple things there. So we are in regular communication with the U.S. Attorney's Office, also the Attorney General's Office. Uh, we have outside bodies that engage in the violence review and, uh, and engage in investigations, MSP. Um, of course, the major, and this is probably more in alignment with the um, Police Commissioner's question, but the major for a GVU is also the major in charge of the task force groups uh, that are with the FBI, DEA, ATF. Uh, and it's also important to realize that what we're talking about is when we fully integrate the strategy, what we're doing is dealing with the violence in the districts. If we're looking at 60 to 75 percent of the homicides and non-fatal shootings are group member involved, what we're doing is using intelligence to realign the pre-existing uh, capabilities of the department to laser focus on where the majority of the problem is, which is the people committing the majority of the homicides and non-fatal shootings. So what we're doing is we're, with better intelligence and moving more quickly, addressing the issues so that, in a way that's sustainable, so that we won't have to worry about it in the future, hopefully. I does think that, that answer your question? I, I think it it does. I'm going to chew on that for a little bit, and, and I'll circle back in a little bit. But in closing, I'm very curious about the effectiveness of, of uh, GVRS and what drives that effectiveness. And I'm curious as to whether or not um, the additional infusion of 30-plus sworn officers is something that leads to that and the extent to which that is, in fact, sustainable over time, considering the severe sworn officer shortage of 600, 700, depending on who you talk to, that we hear about consistently. So when we talk about expansion of GVRS to 
the central and the southwestern, I'm starting to add up the number of bodies that it's going to require, of sworn bodies it's going to require uh, to make that be sustainable. Yeah. No, no different than uh, flooding a specific neighborhood with sworn resources immediately after uh, a rash of, of violent crime, which historically has been a strategy that has been uh, utilized in, in Baltimore City and many other major cities. So, uh, and, and thank you for your question. Once again, what we're talking about is the realignment of existing resources to tackle the issues that already exist within each uh, district. Just with better intelligence, and when you move quicker, and you already and you use the resource you already have instead of simply putting them on a spot, but directing them towards the individuals actually causing the murders, that is where you, you get the effect, which I think uh, Councilman Conway is also familiar with the approach. And, but I, I think that makes sense. I'll, I'll circle back in a little bit, but I appreciate the director and assistant director for the response. Councilman Schleifer. Thank you. Um, how much of the uh, ARPA grant money uh, oh, oh, after like the, I, I saw the list that you sent out, but how much of that money has, has hit the streets already of the awarded grants? Councilman, one clarification point. When you say hit the streets, are you talking about the amount of money that's been expended to organizations or awarded to organizations? No, so I know the amount that's been awarded because it's in the report just as far as how much has already been distributed. Got that. it. One second. Bree, I don't know if you have that number offhand. I just need to pull it. Thank you for your question. Um, so out of the... Uh, the money that has been um, awarded, uh, we have received two, um, just over $2.3 million um, invoices and about $1.8 million has been paid. So about 76% um, of what we've received in invoices has been paid in those ARPA grant awards. Gotcha. I'm sorry, can you just repeat that again? So how much was awarded and how much has been been paid out? Uh, so I gave you uh, the <coughs> amount that we've been invoiced for um, out of those grants awards, which is um, just over 2.3 million, and we have paid out uh, just under 1.8 million. Okay, so, thank you. And um, how much is, uh, is left to be awarded? Just a clarifying question, if I could, Council Member. I'm going back to your first uh, question. Um, what we answered was how much has been invoiced and what we've paid out of what's been invoiced, but I don't think that that's what you asked. No, no, that's, yeah, that's what I'm looking for, like how much of it has actually gone out. So. Ah, okay. And so not how much of it has been on Board of Estimate approved. No, 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 like just Thank you. physically gone out. Yep. Thank you. And you asked for the number that has not yet been awarded. So out of our allocation, that would be $8,573,875. Gotcha. And uh, who internally, like, had, who decides who gets those awards? I'm sure you get a lot more requests than you have money. So who's making that decision? Sure. So the first thing I would say, um, and thank you for that question, not every dollar that we have in our ARPA allocation is meant to be a grant award. Um, there are some service providers that were selected at the initiation of our ARPA portfolio who are strategic partners with the city. So whether we're talking about youth advocate programs that plays a role in the group violence reduction strategy or others, um, these are not all dollars that are going up for competitive awards. Um, but with that being said, the dollars that remain to be allocated, a fair number of them in the reentry category um, and also the youth and trauma category will be um, allocated as competitive grant awards. So on Monty's website, um, we have a competitive grant portal. We're continuing to accept letters of interest and applications. Um, we actually have an application cutoff period of June the 14th that is coming up. And so we're actively reviewing those grants um, with community grant reviewers. They make recommendations about um, the proposals, 
um, the alignment with strategic priorities, the strength of the proposals themselves, the amount of money requested, um, and then those recommendations are advanced to the director who will make a final decision about um, funding amount based on the funds that we have available. Gotcha, and so that, that 8.5 number, that was or wasn't the competitive ones that are left? It's a mix, uh, that speaks to all of the funds within our ARPA allocation that um, is left to be announced. Um, so a fair portion, I would need to total the exact amount that would be for each one of those competitive grant categories. Some we're working in close partnership with the Mayor's Office of Recovery Programs to make sure it is allocated. Um, but we have a strong commitment to ensuring that every dollar is spent, we don't wanna see any dollars going back. Sure, so, so how much of that is is for competitive grants, like ballpark of the 8.5 that you're saying that you have left? Um, I could pull that, but I'll need a minute to do that. No problem, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, one of the things I noted in the, uh, in the budget was the number of GVRS participants. Um, our actual for 2022 is 40. Um, our target for 2023 is 75, and our target for 2024 is 100. Uh, I'm curious, knowing that we plan to expand, expand the program um, into multiple districts over the next year, what we expect to be um, realistically and actually our participants in the program, and then even more, what the um, expected resources are to fully support folks in that program will be. And uh, just for, for uh, to find yourself in the book, it's um, page 160. Thank you for your question. Uh, with regard to the allocation of 40 for fiscal year uh, 22, that was associated with the time period in which we had entered the pilot. Um, and um, I don't know if my recollection serves me well or not, so I'm gonna ask for some grace here. I don't know that I was involved in that number. I think that that might have been projected before um, I, I took the role. With regard to fiscal year 23, um, this target of 75 individuals um, across the two districts um, uh, speaks to the number of GVRS participants um, associated with either ROCA or um, YAP who have sustained their participation. Um, and so we, we want to make sure that because you'll also see level of effectiveness here. Um, these performance measures are kind of intertwined, if you will, um, and so this effectiveness measure around the percentage of GVRS participants who don't recidivate um, with that target of 75% um, does directly connect to this output measure of the number of GVRS participants and that if we see um, recidivism while they're initial participants, we wouldn't, con we wouldn't necessarily consider them, you know, in the program. For lack of a better way to say this, successful um, with regard to um, the level of engagement here. The target for fiscal year 24 associated um, with um, 100, I would have to go back and, and come back to you all with regard to how we extrapolated that number. Sure, because uh, my, my, my thought here is the 100 seems low, um, noting that uh, we expect to be fully launched across the entire city by the end of 24. Um, and so, yeah, I would love, Agreed. Yeah, okay. Happy to come back to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my question is related to the Behind the Wall initiative. Can you provide us the status of the um, plans that you're putting in place for a number of persons in your coordination with the state? 
Yes, thank you for your question. Um, really excited about this work. As I mentioned in my, my opening remarks, right now we um, have 22 folks who are um, currently incarcerated in um, our correctional system who are slated to return to Baltimore City, um, um, who are a part of the work that we are partnering with with uh, the Mayor's Office of Employment Development along with the Baltimore City Recreations and Parks team. Uh, they are um, being uh, transported from their facility on a regular basis with a correctional officer assigned to them and a detailed duty. Um, so they are reporting to um, a city yard to get assigned to a location um, that they are going to uh, do work at when, when they are a part of this work. Um, and just happened to see um, a few folks in East Baltimore who were a part of this work, who are currently incarcerated at BCCC, really excited about having the opportunity um, to give back to the community, but also about the potential for them to uh, work with us to create safe return home plans um, and um, the likelihood that if um, matriculating through this program successfully, that they have the potential opportunity to become city employees. And so really excited about that um, as we wrap up um, this work for this fiscal year and uh, partnering with DPSCS to um, introduce 500 new folks um, next fiscal year and 500 the following year. Thank you. Um, and for the plans, can you give us a brief overview of the plans so that members of the committee can understand as well as the public? Because I think that's where the intentionality is. And you mean the safe return home plan, sir? Yes, ma'am. Um, so thank you for that. We do have a process map that we created for the safe return home plans that goes all the way back to 18 months in which uh, we're partnering with case managers who are already working behind the wall um, with DPSCS, making the connections with the Mayor's Office of Employment Development. Uh, Monty does have a, a, a reentry coordinator position that's responsible for going behind the wall, having the initial conversations with individuals about what that work looks like in partnership with our agencies, extending an invitation for them to participate in that work, but then also having um, conversations with them about what they anticipate will be their largest barriers or challenges when they go home. Um, other steps associated with preparing for that safe return home plan is to the extent that these um, folks who are um, currently incarcerated have family members and or um, folks that they'd like to return home to, um, asking them about engaging with them as well so that the conversations are really communal about what these folks perceive as the barriers and or challenges associated with this individual's return home so that we're able to provide a comprehensive level of support uh, to those individuals. It also involves partnering to make sure that folks have the appropriate documentation associated with an I-9 and employment um, when they're coming home and making sure um, that they are connected with the Mayor's Office of Employment Development. One of the um, things about this strategy that's worth sharing with this um, committee and also with Baltimore is that we're paying these individuals $15 an hour. It is worth noting that folks that are behind the wall typically make cents on the dollar. I mean, folks are working for a full month and making anywhere between three and six dollars for the month. And so three dollars and 12 cents of every um, hour's worth of work goes directly to uh, these folks while they're incarcerated to account for commissary, to account for um, what we call set-asides, which means that if they owe any fines, fees, or restitutions for the, the um, the crimes that they have committed, that, that, uh, that a portion of those funds are also allocated to that. But the other portion of those funds are funds that are delivered to those folks by DPSCS upon their release. And so you have folks coming into the community already um, with um, one of their biggest barriers at least initially addressed. One of the first things that you're looking for is how am I going to sustain living? Um, how do I get a job? How am I going to make ends meet? Am I going to go back to the corner? Am I going to go back to the activity that drove me here? And so making sure that folks have the availability of those dollars uh, immediately at release is one of the benefits of this program as well. 
Thank you, that was great to hear because one of the things that I've noticed even in my district with residents who are returning, they cannot afford the uh, monitoring fees for actual parole and probations. Um, I wanna speak something that's near and dear to me because my mother was a returning citizen and had to become mom when she came home. So what supports are we particularly offering women as they are becoming, coming from behind the walls? Because immediately, I hate to say this, um, men have an opportunity not to be dad right away, but women have to be mom right away. So I wanna know what supports we have for women. I really appreciate that question and I'll start, but then I'll ask the, the CAO um, to piggyback because it was through a connection that she made to Monsi um, around um, um, Be More Reconnects and around um, Pivot Baltimore, which is a, a reentry program that is specifically focused on supporting women, um, whether it means um, making sure that women have the opportunity to have um, a different type of parenting class and interactions with their children as they prepare to come home, um, what um, uh, making sure that they uh, uh, feel like they can safely re-engage with their uh, children after being separated with them or from them for a while is very much a part of that work. And um, we're, we're grateful to have the School of Social Work as a partner here, um, along with uh, Veronica Jackson over at Pip Pivot. Um, Madam CAO, anything to add here? No, I think the director hit the nail on the head. So I thank you for asking that question as to my mother was a returning citizen. So this work around women returning home from incarceration is very important to me. Um, so through this partnership that Director Jackson talked about, we're actually focusing not just on women, um, but we are focusing on parents who um, uh, have children, um, so children with incarcerated parents. And so we actually received a three-year grant from the Department of Justice to focus on this population. And so what we are doing in partnership with the University of Maryland School of Social Work and Pivot, um, as well as a number of partners, is actually offering some of um, uh, parenting classes while individuals are incarcerated. Um, we're also doing some work with the state around how we can um, reduce the trauma and vi during visitation, for example, um, and really helping to provide um, the support um, while individuals are currently incarcerated, but then also helping to support um, parents um, post-incarceration. So we're really excited about this partnership um, that we've been able to forge. Um, we're only a couple of months in, I may, maybe seven to eight months in, um, but we're really proud of the work that we're able to do with this DOJ grant. Thank you. Um, I'm going to head out for the evening, but Director Jackson, I just want to thank you for your service. Um, as well as your partnership, I look forward to introducing our Office of Returning Citizens because I just want to be frank, colleagues, as I've been lobbying you the last couple of months in reference to this legislation. This is near and dear to me. Um, both my parents were returning citizens. I also serve a district that is filled with returning citizens. Most persons who return back to Baltimore return back to the Seventh Council District. So I see this work, the intentionality, the 18 months matters. I say that because I've had constituents who were violated for parole and probation because they lied about having a place to live. These conversations, these intentional vulnerability moments for participants as well as our staff to have these discussions are important. I say they're important because that's one last person who is in survival mode that's gonna commit a crime when they return to Baltimore. That's one last person that's gonna not tell us they don't have a system or a support system there for them. So I just wanna urge my colleagues to look to the substance, but also support the substance at the same time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, um, Director, you mentioned earlier about 911 diversion. Um, and obviously that's something that the mayor has talked about for a long time. Um, I will ask the police department tomorrow about the smart policing and how that's going. Um, uh, I know that um, you had mentioned that there was uh, more examination of what are some of the things that can be diverted so that it's not a police response. Um, it's a much more you know, targeted response. Um, right now, uh, 988 is just suicidal ideation. So um, when you're talking about from the Monsi perspective, of 911 diversion. Tell me a little bit more about what you're thinking about and then also the other topics that you've discovered in your, um, in your uh, study. 
Thank you for the question. I'm, I'm actually going to call up our policy and research director who's been charged with digging into um, national 911 calls in addition to Baltimore City calls um, to really get us to a place where we're able to identify at least four other call types. But what our focus has been uh, for the Scott administration is identifying at least four other call types that aren't necessarily connected to um, a behavioral health response. Um, so that we can figure out what community-based assets and or um, institutional assets we could uh, leverage and as a result reduce the burden on our emergency responders um, in this way. So, um, John, when you are ready. Um, so thanks for your question. Yeah, the first, I'd say the first stage of what we're looking at is to look beyond behavioral health. And um, just came from a conference on this, and we have recently done an analysis of 911 call data on this. And what we're looking at, the key thing, and this is, so I mentioned the conference because we don't need to recreate the wheel. There's a lot of success stories across the country. And one of the interesting things is wherever um, cities have started with a select number of calls, like we're doing with, let's say we're identifying four, they actually, in many cases, are ramping up beyond that. Um, which is a testament to the success of the initial four and the fact that you know the overwhelming majority of 911 calls right now, um, including ones beyond behavioral health, are nonviolent and um, not associated with any follow-up crime or anything. So uh, the key thing we're doing is looking at the actual call narratives to say um, to characterize calls by what's actually happening, and they may that may go across different coded call types of the moment. So we're looking at, for example, housing assistance, um, conflict resolution related calls, whether it's juvenile disturbances, family disturbance, um, squeegee disturbances. But you know, the key thing is you, know, you don't go by the coded call type that's at the moment the dispatch call, but rather look at all the calls and see what's actually um, being heard by the dispatcher. Um, and at the moment where we've identified the four I just mentioned as good candidates for uh, initial alternative response. And the alternative response um, is a, com a community responder team that's appropriate to provide the services and the needs of, uh, you know, whatever the needs are of that call that's coming in. And the key, holistically, that we're looking at is an integrated system. So we want all the different call types we're talking about to be coordinated so people get the needs, services they need. So uh, say that again, conflict resolution. Uh, yeah, three types of conflict, three categories of conflict resolution, a juvenile, you know, involving juvenile disturbances, family disturbances, and specifically squeegee disturbance calls that involve some conflict resolution. And again, all, all of those, part of the process is that the call taker does a screen and screens out calls that would involve weapons or other violence that wouldn't be appropriate for this. Um, and then the other is, calls related to some need for housing assistance. So report of someone who's on the street and either at risk of being homeless or in a situation where they need housing. Interesting. So um, you, you went through basically a lot of calls <laughs> mm -hmm. to listen in on what, um, what was being talked about and that these were what was highlighted or, or just based on what you learned at the conference and best practices, this is what we're starting to go with. Uh, a combination of both. It's, okay. it, there, there's overlap. So the call analysis we did for Baltimore was to check whether what's the case for other cities applies here. And for the most part, it does. I mean, it's a similar pattern of uh, what calls we see coming in. And it's reassuring that the ones we've identified, we have a track, you know, there's a path to stand that up that's already been established elsewhere. So. Well, actually, it's really interesting that the, you know, um, the three uh, conflict mediation um, call types came up because, frankly, that's a precursor to potential violence, right? Exactly. So, you know, if we're catching what could potentially be violence before it actually happens, similar to what Seishri said, similar to what, you know, we're um, asking Baltimore Community Mediation, some of the others, then that, that's actually pretty good. I mean, that, I think, will help us a lot. Yeah, and just to build on that, to take it one step further, I think it's also uh, potentially preventing tragedies or violence in the call response, because if you have a, the appropriate 
person responding who has the skills to respond to what the call is about, it reduces the risk of a misunderstanding or other things happening on the call? In the moment. In the moment, In correct. the moment. So yeah. in addition to maybe trying to have a, a conflict mediation session elsewhere at some other point, there could be somebody 911 trained, somebody 911 trained to really answer those calls and try to mediate the conflict at the moment as well as sending out a response team or something like that, right? Exactly, it's two tier, yeah. It's uh -huh. in the moment having a better response for the needs at that moment and then also potentially a better follow through in, in terms of providing the person the services down the road that they need. This is great. So these were calls that came, when you screened out the violence piece, these were the top four. If I, if I could check. Violence and behavior health, right? So if I could check in here for a second, what I would say is that what we're sharing with um, this committee um, is a preliminary assessment and sure. would want to come back to the committee with um, some, some final uh, decisions and, and recommendations um, post a, a conversation with the mayor. Sure, because you want to have the whole sort of spectrum, this whole system pretty much in place before, you know, make, but uh, anyway, I'm glad you shared the information because those of us who've been trained in conflict mediation probably, you know, have already felt like this would be a, a really important resource um, anyway, um, just to try to, again, get ahead of and, you know, um, the violence, because our violence right now in a lot of ways is conflict. Mm -hmm. It's conflict. So if we can get ahead of the game, that would be super important. So thanks for taking that time for that evaluation. And I look forward to um, the more full uh, assessment and evaluation and, and how you're gonna um, put that in, in place. And I, I don't need to make it a request. I know that you will be reporting to us um, in public safety on that, correct? Yep. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Madam Director. Uh, so similar line of questioning to my colleague. Um, last year, we made a big push in the budget to get some more funds to BCRI, Baltimore Crisis Response, um, knowing that uh, Baltimore has an opportunity to once again lead as it relates to behavioral and mental health crises and having interventions that are not just police, but in some cases co-responder or um, you know, mental health folks uh, participating. Um, where are we with that? Like, was that money well spent? Um, because it seems that the mental health crisis in our city has not abated, um, right? We know we are continuing to see a lot of folks struggle from mental health perspective. We know we have far too few clinicians in our hospitals. We have far too few beds in psychiatric wards um, and that folks are often cycling in and out. Um, so was hoping to get something of an update on where Baltimore crisis response was and sort of how it fits into this larger strategy as well. Thank you for your question. Uh, so the, the contract that Monsi issued through ARPA dollars for um, BCRI was executed by the Board of Estimates back in uh, mid-January of this year. Um, and so they still have some, some significant time on their contract. I think to date, um, we've been built less than about a third um, with regard to uh, the work that they have been um, uh, uh, stepping through in, in partnership with um, in, in partnership with others who are working through the 911 diversion related work on behavioral health. Um, I'm going to turn it over to um, either the chief or to the um, finance director to answer any questions specific to uh, performance measures related to the work, um, given that I, I don't have my laptop and I keep shifting over. Um, so Chief Mavronis or Associate Director Young, um, any additional information that you all have to add here uh, would be helpful. Thanks, Director. Um, for BCRI in particular, we are currently waiting on their first quarterly report, so that'll give us a full readout of their qualitative and quantitative progress to date. Um, I know that our team has had some good initial conversations with them. I know we've recently assigned a new program manager from our side to work with them. Um, and so we've been having conversations sort of about how spend has gone to date, and I think we're really looking forward to that first quarterly report, which is going to show us what the progress has looked like and what their reach has looked like as a result of the investment. 
Great, I appreciate that and would very much appreciate if you could report out to us and let us know. Um, definitely a few members um, were involved during budget negotiations last year and really pushing to augment their um, capacity. And um, I just think, again, as we see, uh, not just the conflicts that escalate, but also um, pretty severe mental health crises taking place in our communities, just really important to have a robust team of responders um, and that it, I hope, becomes institutionalized within our city and is not seen as like some, you know, nonprofit that we just sometimes contract with, but is like part of the work that we do when someone dials 988 or, you know, it, Dallas 911, but actually needs a mental health response that we really have a more thought out system to respond, um, just as you are doing around conflict and everything else. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can we go back to the statistics around violence in the Western District? Um, there were some numbers you referenced in the um, initial presentation. If you could please hit on those again. Specific to the Western District yep. and the group violence reduction strategy. Forgive me here, just trying to. No problem. Find my page. Since the beginning of the pilot program in the Western District in January of 2022, mm -hmm. homicides and non fatal shootings are down a combined 25.24%, is the and, statistic that I shared. And so January 1 through today is 17 months, right? Yes. Is it those 17 months over what period, the previous 17 month period? So, so the, the January 2022 through present is, um, yes, like a year or a, a period over period comparison, uh, especially considering the fact that the Western District itself um, is the one that's been the most historically violent um, over the past five to, to eight years in our city as it relates to gun violence. Got it. So the, the period is the last 17 months. What, are you, what period are you comparing this 17 months to to come up with that 25.4% reduction? Joseph, can you help with that? Joseph is our associate, uh, I'm sorry, our deputy director of data analytics. What's your, what's your last name, sir? Muhausen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Um, so it's a, we comparing uh, 12 months. So it's um, the past 12 months from today's date. To, um, so June fifth of um, June fifth of twenty two through June fifth of twenty twenty three compared to what what's the period you're comparing it to? So we're comparing June fifth of uh, this year all the way to one year ago to the same period, one year. So the comparison is you're comparing. June of 22 through 23 against June of 21 through 22, correct? Yeah. No? no? You, you, you're comparing January to June versus January to June, year to date, right? So you're asking me about the 17 months period, right? No, I'm, well, I'm, the, the director referenced a 25.4% reduction. So the 25.4% reduction is I don't mean to be crass, is one number divided by another number? What does the first number represent? What's the date range divided by what number? So we have, for but, the year 2022, yeah. for the full year, from January to December, 
Um, and let me, let me just pull the numbers in front of me so I don't give you the wrong information. Uh, we had a reduction in homicides and non-fatal shootings of minus uh, 33%. So for calendar 22 versus calendar 21, correct? Yes. And then for the period in 2023, just taking 2023. So, so January 1 to today. through today of 23 yes. versus January 1 to June whatever of 2022. Of 2022. That's where you get the 25.4% reduction? So let me give you this number. For the Western, um, for this uh, period, this year, we get a reduction of 2%. 2%? Mm-hmm. So um, where, can someone tell me where the 25.4% came from? Yes. So uh, when we talk about the beginning of the pilot program starting in January of 2022, which is well over a year ago, up through now, what we see is a 25.24%. The question that you're asking about whether or not it was a like period to like period comparison is yes. The, the reduction that we are seeing year to date at this point in the Western District is that we are down about 2% in the Western District. That is because at this point in the year, we are really in competition against ourselves. Um, we are um, looking at numbers in 2023 that compare to the, pretty much the, the apex, to use your word, of um, the, the work that we were doing in the pilot in the Western District last year. Okay, so the, thank you for that mm -hmm. context. Yeah. I assume that will be helpful in a larger conversation, but the no one has, I, I don't believe, and forgive me if, if um, Mr. Mulhausen or, or Director, you have answered this. The 25.4% reduction that was in your introduction statement, that is a comparison of which period to which period. Someone, put that information in a briefing book. It came yes. from somewhere. Can someone please help me understand where it came from? So I'll allow the director a moment to, to look this information sure. up, but what I will offer is that we can also submit the calculation to you formally. Okay, that would be helpful. The, so now to the reason why I'm asking the question. When we say there's a 2% reduction or a 25.4% reduction or a 33% reduction. Um, those, those are over some period of time versus a comparable period of time. My question is, I'll just use, let's just use the, let's use the 25.4% just for the sake of conversation. That's a 25.4% reduction in the total number of non-fatal shootings plus the total number of homicides versus, versus the previous period of the sum of the total number of non-fatal shootings and the total number of homicides, is that correct? So to the CAO's point, I'll make sure that we double check and get the answer um, back to you around the period. But yes, my assumption would be that we're doing a like period over like period calculation um, for each period that we're, we're talking about. So January uh, 2022 through present with the 25.24% down, again, I'll double check on that number, but I think that it, is safe to assume that I, I would be assuming that we're talking about a like period over the you know the previous year um, when we talk about the 33.8 percent down um, at the end of the year last year that was a comparison over the previous year and sure. when we talk about the down two percent this year to date that is compared to last year and that's why the the point that I made about us essentially competing against ourselves. Um, as it relates to the implementation of GVRS is really where we, uh, where we are right now and happy to talk to this, this body about the work that we're doing to make sure that we get back to 
Thank you for sharing that. Um, Council President's team, we got the, the kind of the time frame around all three of those numbers, the 2%, the 25.4, and I think you said 33.8. Um, but let me ask my question again, because I, I don't think it was, uh, it was probably inadvertently not answered. The, the question was, the reduction is the sum of non-fatal plus fatal shootings against the comparable period sum of fatal plus non-fatal shootings, correct? Yes, I, I thought I did answer that. If I didn't, okay. forgive me. I, I apologize if I missed that, Director. So what, what I'm interested in is what those numbers are around homicide, because there are more non-fatal shootings that occur in the city than there are homicides, and as tragic as non-fatal shootings are, homicides unfortunately are forever. Thank you. These numbers are not through today, but they are uh, BPD's ComStat numbers through last Tuesday. And um, this is year year to date. Sorry. To yes, interrupt, these director. are the year to date numbers. Okay. And it looks like as of for the week ending 527 in the Western District, uh, the aggregated number of homicides and non-fatal shootings had us down 7%, with non-fatal shootings being down 10%, and homicides at that point being at 21. Down 21%. I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Milhausen, I might have you double-check this number as well. It looks like the numbers on the report may have been transposed, um, but it appears to be... Uh, up 21 percent. Is, is that, is that what you're seeing in ComStat through 527? Um, I don't. I don't have the ComStat report with me. We may need to come back to you with that number, sir. But you initially said up 21 percent. Based on the report that I'm looking at right here, yes, and it also appears that that this report may have some numbers transposed. So happy again to come back to you. Okay, um, I appreciate the, the answers. Um, Nate, I think you covered all of that. We had comps that. Can we, I'm gonna, I'll circle back with this because I get the weekly XM. Um, I'm, I'll circle back on this point and Nate, when I circle back, I'll tighten up my request with, with some more clarity. Councilman Schleifer. Uh, Councilman Conway. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I want to circle back uh, a little bit to uh, the conversation on the Peacemobile. Um, can you tell me a little bit about what the Peacemobile is, what it does? We'll start there. Thank you for your question. The Peacemobile is uh, an RV that was originally uh, detailed to the Mayor's Office of Employment Development under the Pew Administration through a philanthropic grant uh, from a local foundation. Um, that vehicle was not being used by the Mayor's Office of Employment Development and in coming into uh, the administration, there had already been some uh, state funded dollars that were secured associated with the development of um, a vehicle of this type. And so we had a couple of options there. One was to do a purchase of our own and uh, didn't make a lot of sense uh, given that we wanted to be good stewards of city dollars. And so partnered with the Mayor's Office of Employment Development, the Department of Transportation, DGS, um, to get this vehicle outfitted. Um, in very similar ways as uh, the Peace Mobile that we see operating in um, five boroughs in New York. They actually have five um, Peace Mobiles in New York. And 
it's essentially meant to be um, a one-stop shop for resources um, for our community. So whether we're talking about someone who is a returning citizen and doesn't have the paperwork that they need in order to complete an Anon, and we actually saw that on the very first day uh, and went back the next day to partner with folks. Um, so proactive response in communities meant to be um, uh, exactly what it sounds like, us meeting people where they are, but also meant to be reactive um, when uh, we need to mobilize into communities based on um, traumatic events that are happening and using um, those social service data points, those quality of life data points, and emergency service data points to determine what resources from a community and a, a city agency perspective should be deployed. Got it. So um, just to make sure I understand you correctly, the, the vehicle was donated to us? So as I mentioned before, the vehicle um, was uh, uh, the Mayor's Office of Employment Development's vehicle long before the Scott administration. I am under the impression that it is a vehicle that was grant, granted to us through a philanthropic foundation uh, when um, Catherine Pugh was mayor. Oh, so I'll further clarify. It, it was donated to us in a different capacity before. Correct. We've now upfitted it. And that for vehicle this was not being used any longer. It was sitting in a DOT tow yard. Got it. Uh, and then uh, for the upfitting of the vehicle, uh, the funding to upfit that vehicle came from what? Came from the state of Maryland through the um, VIP grant and was already um, a, a grant that was approved uh, upon this administration start. It's just taken a while to get it on the road due to supply chain issues associated with COVID. I appreciate that. And then as far as operating the vehicle, um, staff and otherwise, how, how are we thinking about that piece? So at this point, we've been partnering with the Department of um, General Services and DOT who have provided uh, drivers to Monsey for the few days that the vehicle's been on the road. Um, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, we do have a position uh, associated with uh, this work for a CDL uh, driver who is also meant to be an outreach worker who would work closely with our manager of coordinated neighborhood stabilization responses so that the vehicle is able to be in communities both on a proactive and a reactive basis. Really grateful to Councilwoman McCray for letting us start um, our proactive engagement in her district, um, specifically uh, across um, a six a six uh, square block radius in the northeastern. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Director, can you give me the status of the um, neighborhood policing plans work? Um, I know that was a multi agent. That's a multi the neighborhood policing plans work. Um, that's a multi-agency approach um, and not exactly aligned in the same areas of GVRS, but um, certainly part of the strategy. I'm particularly interested in it just because it does have a housing component. So I'm interested to see from you um, what the um, status is. Are we seeing reductions there, engagement, et cetera, et cetera? Thank you for your question. Uh, the Neighborhood Policing Plan strategy is a part of um, the city's and BPD strategy associated with community policing um, and does have a direct tie to uh, the consent decree uh, that the city of Baltimore and BPD are under. Uh, it affords us the opportunity to partner not only with BPD but also agencies like DHCD, uh, DPW, DOT, BSIT, um, who obviously owns the 311 system, um, and some other partners, including Rex and Parks, um, and some, some other partners there. Uh, we have, we are actually slated to complete um, our first two pilots at the end of June of this year. Um, and those two uh, communities, uh, Fayette Street Outreach in West Baltimore and GBA in South Baltimore, have submitted their two-year um, neighborhood policing plans um, to us. In addition to that, ARPA funds were used to um, create a, a rubric associated with making a decision uh, rooted in equity and um, um, 
access needs based on ACERA, which is the, the scanning, the assessing, the response, and the analyze portion of the work to determine um, how that funding should be spent. Um, what we will be doing over the course of the next two years is evaluating um, what the um, outcomes of um, this funding and of this plan will look like. The plans are um, in the hands of the Department of Justice. Uh, and with the consent decree monitoring team right now so that they um, have their eyes on it. It is not our expectation that they're going to request that neighborhoods make any changes, but they may be requesting that the city of Baltimore or um, the uh, Baltimore Police Department engage um, in a different way should they, should they not um, uh, see that as a part of the plan that uh, we're being meaningful stakeholders. I would offer that that's not likely to be the case. Um, as we move forward into fiscal year 24, we have launched another request for applications. It is a competitive request, another round of um, ARPA funding for neighborhood policing plans so that we can start our next cohort associated with this work. Um, and really excited to, to take a look and see what uh, GBA and, and FSO are gonna do. Um, could you send us that information so we can get it out to our various um, communities? When is the deadline for the application? Yes, ma'am. When is the deadline? June 14th. June 14th is the it's deadline. coming up. <laughs> um, I don't know how I missed it, so if you don't mind sending it over, that Will would be do. super. Um, and then uh, it's interesting that I didn't, I guess I didn't realize that this was all connected with, with DOJ. Um, there was a... Uh, somebody emailed me um, an article that um, it comes from the DOJ about community policing, and it was a whole set of recommendations that was about housing and about vacant and abandoned properties, which, by the way, I've been talking about for a million years, but it was nice to actually <laughs> see that the, GO, the DOJ is also saying part of community policing is actually addressing vacant properties, period, end of story. And so it sounds like you're taking, with that in mind, you're taking all of the various pieces um, that can be and is community policing, putting it in this plan, and then the buy-in then, of course, from the agencies to make sure that they're, you know, working through what the plan actually says um, in terms of, you know, foreclosing on the property through NREM, going through, you know, SEPTED, all, all of those things. Is that, that's what the next two years is doing for these two organizations, these two neighborhoods? Yes, I would also offer that the Department of um, Housing and Community <clears throat> Development have a separate ARPA allocation associated with uh, blight remediation as a part of the neighborhood policing plans. Mm -hmm. And so those dollars are separate from the ones that we've issued to these two respective communities. Um, while um, those projects will be worked on um, simultaneously, we wanted to make sure that the community uh, themselves could uh, focus on um, um, areas in addition to blight remediation, in addition to septed related items, because those are, those expend funds fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I didn't realize that D, uh, DHCD, as part of their blight elimination, had an ARPA allocation that goes to just this. There's a million dollars per neighborhood, those two neighborhoods, as a part of the pilot. Oh, oh okay. It's in the whole list there. Okay, yes. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Um, yeah, I look forward to um, seeing the results after the two-year uh, pilot. And then, again, if you can get us the information on the application, that would be great. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Madam Director, again, and to your team. Um, I want to talk a little bit about succession and um, what comes next for Monsi. Um, it is a large body of work that you have endeavored. Uh, there are multiple components to this strategy. It is um, intense. It is everything from neighborhood stabilization to GVRS to safe streets to probably a whole bunch of other acronyms. Um, wanted to ask first, just from the administration's perspective, and so maybe this is for city administrator, um, is there a commitment to retain this strategy, this same strategy um, beyond when uh, Director Jackson um, retires. And I say that because I think 
in Baltimore, we do a lot of lurching when it comes from to public safety. We tend to go from strategy to strategy, and I think we end up um, not always doing ourselves a great service by doing that. So um, for City Administrator Leach, um, is there a commitment from the administration to stay on the same course um, once Director Jackson leaves city government? Thank you, sir. I appreciate the question. Um, I actually want to take an opportunity to publicly thank Director Jackson for all of her work. Um, we have seen the exponential growth um, in, in Monty, but we've also seen the exponential impact that having an organization like Monty has had on the city of Baltimore. So on behalf of, on behalf of the administration, I just want to publicly thank her. Um, for her just relentless pursuit of excellence um, and the incredible team that she's built around her. I think when we look around this room, um, what, what Director Jackson will leave behind, um, one, is a legacy, um, but two, an incredible team who will continue to work every single day um, to continue the deep investments um, that Director Jackson um, really has started with the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement. Um, so I am very clear from my perspective and then also from the Mayor's perspective that we know we are going in the right direction. Um, and Director Jackson's leadership um, and what she's been able to achieve over the past two years only uh, reaffirmed our commitment to this work. Um, and again, we have an incredible team um, that Director Jackson will leave behind that will continue, uh, that will continue this work. Um, and we hope to find a director um, that will also just continue to double down on these efforts. But um, I wanna be very clear um, that the mayor is very much committed to the strategy um, that we've begun under Director Jackson's leadership and we will only double down on those investments. I appreciate that. Um, Director Jackson, from your perspective, how are you thinking about passing the baton and making sure that there is continuity and there is wholeness in, uh, in the work? Because again, it is um, a lot and there's a lot of it and um, it'd be a tricky one for someone to step into. And so I'm curious how you're thinking about how to effectively pass down all that you and your team have started. And again, do fully acknowledge that, like any agency, it is not just about you, it's about the team that you build um, and the folks that are in front of us. Uh, but I'm curious how you're thinking about, you know, in sort of the twilight, if you will, of your tenure here, um, how you're thinking about how to effectively ensure continuity and ensure that uh, the work continues in the best way possible. Thanks for your question. I, th I think the first thing that I'll say is please don't date me. I'm not retiring just yet. <laughs> um, um, I will echo what we heard from the chief administrative officer that uh, the team that has been built to support Baltimore um, is well equipped to continue to do this work. Um, I would also offer uh, that we are in the final phases of finalizing a transition document because it's important to me to leave a place better than I found it um, and to make sure that there is um, a, a document that gets handed over associated with transition. Um, the chief administrator and I um, have also talked about ensuring that that transition is one that happens smoothly to ensure that there is no interruption of work for Baltimore City. And so looking forward to doing that as well. Um, but what I would say here is that I consider my role as the executive director of this agency one in which I'm responsible for bridging the mayor's strategic goal with the tactical work and that the folks that you see sitting with me are the the linchpins to getting that work done. Um, and so Baltimore is left in very capable hands. I'm, I'm looking forward to continuing to be their cheerleader and showing up for events um, and um, supporting them as they continue the momentum that they've already built. Appreciate that. And again, thank you for your service. Colleagues, any other questions? Yes, sir, I've got two. Conway. In a hearing earlier today, um, or maybe I'm losing track of time, I don't know what it was. <laughs> we talked a little bit about the, um, 
the Ring Camera Rebate Program. Historically, the Ring Camera Rebate Program. Uh, historically, that program um, was run out of MOCJ. Uh, of course, with the changeover to Monsi, um, things changed. Um, I've had constituents who've tried to get rebates for the program, and it's taken over six months, seven months. Um, and so I, I, w I wanted to know who was the main point of contact in uh, Monsi for the rebate program, realizing that it could have huge implications for safety in neighborhoods. Uh, thanks for your question. I would offer that um, the City Watch program moved out of Monsi's budget portfolio last fiscal year and is the responsibility of BSIT at this point. Okay. Please. Um, that issue is near and dear to me. That was my legislation. Do we have um, funding available in, in BSIT for camera rebates, Madam Budget Director? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll review BSIT's budget and circle back with you all. Okay. I, I don't think we saw a line item in there, but if you could get back to us on that. Thank you so much. Councilman? Thank you. Um, so I, you guys have no part in, anymore in the program. Is, would that be fair to say? We no longer manage that service, no. Okay, thank you. Um, my second question is regarding safe streets. And one of the big issues that we've had is around turnover and staffing. I'm curious how you guys have been thinking about um, sustainability, staffing, so on and so forth with safe streets and the sites. Um, this has been particularly an issue in, in, my, in my safe street site on Woodburn. Thank you for your question. Um, I'll bring up uh, Deputy Director uh, Crystal Miller, who's responsible for the community violence intervention work. She uh, works most closely with our two strategic partners who are responsible for Safe Street Site Administration um, and uh, would ask her to share with you all what we're seeing from, um, uh, from a staffing perspective um, this year compared to what it looked like when we were uh, managing administration through up to eight different folks in order to demonstrate that consistency, um, strategic intent, and partnership really is driving our ability to uh, maintain the workforce. Uh, thank you for your question, uh, Deputy Director of Community Violence Intervention, Crystal Miller, for the record. Um, to answer your question, what we're seeing, um, one, with um, a condensed um, a strategic partnership with two CBOs versus eight is it allows us um, better communication around hiring and being very strategic about um, maintaining staffing and working with those partners on making sure that staff are receiving um, adequate training and that they are receiving adequate support so they are able to stay in their positions um, and receive the supports and services to do their jobs and do them, their jobs effectively. Uh, what we are looking at around hiring is being very intentional and deliberate and making sure we have qualified people in those positions and adhering to our hiring process process and working with our partnerships in BPD and with our um, CBO partners and CBI providers on uh, hiring staff um, and adhere again adhering to that process so that we get qualified candidates who have credibility in their communities that they'll be working in and the 10 sites across the city. Uh, how are we thinking about retaining staff as well? Certainly hiring is important. I think we've talked about that with every agency. Uh, a big part is also retaining the staff we do have. Mm -hmm. Do we have any understanding of you know, what it is that's leading folks to, to leave our safe street sites? Yep, happy to start here and then turn it back over to the, the deputy um, director. What we've heard very clearly from our safe streets team members um, is that investing in them is something that's critically important associated with maintaining uh, them as employees, which is no different than any of us, right? And so what do training and development opportunities look like? What does a um, uh, uh, well thought out career trajectory look like? So as we think about the work that Safe Streets workers do in particular around outreach and violence interruption, what's the next step for them? Um, as we think about the CBI ecosystem, one of the logical next steps is how do we get you to a place of potentially becoming a life coach? Um, and really thinking that through as we think about the ecosystem as a whole. Outreach is a component, violence interruption is a component, um, 
life coaching is a component and they kind of turn into each other uh, with a, a growing level of complexity. And so we are partnering um, with a local university around um, accreditation, around training, around an academy, um, and happy to have the, the, the deputy speak more about that. And I, I, want, I want to- I think that's one of the keys to reducing attrition um, in, in the safe streets. Uh, Team base. I appreciate that. I, I, I also, I'm, I'm curious if we have any data from exit interviews or anything to suggest um, very specifically what some of the known issues are, uh, if that helps us really think about. But please, go ahead. Sure, no problem. And again, thank you for the question. Uh, so um, following up on what Director Jackson just spoke about, um, some of those supports look like providing the staff with mental health and trauma supports um, in our partnership with Associated Catholic Charities and providing mental health um, trauma support from um, peer recovery and peer support staff and also those who are certified in providing those mental health supports um, through their services that they provide. And that is available and open to all staff at all 10 sites to help them work through their traumas that they experience every day doing the work that they do and from any previous traumas they may have experienced in their lives. Also, um, we're making sure staff are receiving proper training um, and continuous training. We have a very intentional five-year trajectory plan for staff to receive training to help them develop and matriculate through positions within the Safe Streets program, but also to graduate to other um, professions outside of safe, safe streets. Um, we've seen success in this where staff have received their CDLs and been able to um, move from a safe streets position while working there for a certain amount of time, receiving that certification and going on to a different career path and utilizing that certification. Um, I'm really excited about the program and the partnership that we have with the University of Baltimore for the certification and conflict mediation and really professionalizing the work which will support in re reducing turnover in staff um, with staff because we're now putting in a lot of investment and um, and really highlighting the work that they're doing um, and putting some, um, some pride behind what they're doing. Um, something else that we've um, implemented is uh, their salary and making sure that they are receiving a livable wage um, to again support with reducing turnover. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, if I could ask. Okay. Um, and, and sorry, I know people want to go to bed, but I, I got questions to ask. Um, oh, please, go ahead, Director. I was just gonna add one more point here connected to the certification that we're working on with the University of Baltimore. It's gonna give us the opportunity to demonstrate an even um, deeper level of effective stewardship of city dollars, given some legislation that was passed at the state level last year by Senator Sidnor and Delegate Smith, mm -hmm. where we can leverage billing Medicaid and Medicare for CVI work when individuals who are part of a program have a certification associated with that, it will help us grow out the CVI ecosystem in ways that don't necessarily have financial impacts to the funding that we need for CVI as we cycle folks through that training program. Mm. Good to know. Um, thank you. Uh, the other question I had was um, regarding coordinated neighborhood uh, stabilization responses. Um, are we measuring, of, of course we're measuring the stabilization responses that we're doing, do we have a measure of their effectiveness or their efficacy? We do, we actually measure a couple of key points there, as I mentioned um, before, uh, 14 of them to date. Um, it is worth noting that uh, in the pilot phase, we thought that we were only gonna be able to get through eight, just mm -hmm. given the sheer volume of instances here in Baltimore City and our desire to make sure that these vehicles or, or that what would become um, the Peace Mobile didn't translate into a trauma trigger for folks. Every time this orange vehicle shows up in your community, it means that someone is hurting. Um, we did also partner with community-based individuals for proactive engagements. This is something um, that I talked to my victim services associate director and to 
um, the group violence deputy director about often. We did a coordinated neighborhood stabilization response in the aftermath of the Princess Plaza takedown. And for a sustained period of time, even after we left, we didn't see any shootings in that neighborhood at all. Um, I don't know, Deputy Director, if you still have the statistics associated with that that we just discussed a couple of weeks ago. And so we're not only measuring the number of folks that we have initial engagements with, but the number of folks that we're directly connecting to services, um, the number of folks who, um, as a result of victimization, have been connected to uh, relocation and or um, employment. Um, we've, we've had discussions about um, folks becoming phlebotomists shortly after um, engaging with us when indicating that they needed employment or moving. Um, so we do have very specific uh, measures, not only output measures, but also outcome measures that we're happy to share. I would love, I was just gonna ask for that, if that's something we could uh, add to the follow-up items for the agency, just uh, the outcome metrics for the um, neighborhood, sta neighborhood stabilization responses. Thank you. Um, and then one more question I want to touch on here. Um, um, about the Youth Connection Centers, how many young people have been served at the Youth Connection Centers so far? I'll have, to get the, I'll have to get the details for you associated with the number of young people that we've engaged while out doing the street engagement. Um, with regard to young people that have actually come into the center to date, I believe we've had two young folks um, actually come into the center. Those two young folks weren't even transported into the center. They walked into the center on their own. Um, in West Baltimore, um, we have not had the need to transport any young people to the center, and quite frankly, that has everything to do with the level of messaging um, that we put in place. 80,000 palm cards were delivered to Baltimore City uh, public school backpacks. Um, I'm sure that you all have gotten the text messages that say that, say that it's curfew time. Um, we have partnered with um, Radio One, and so on 92Q and w, um, uh, uh, WEAA and 95.9, folks are getting that message. Um, so the, the beauty of this engagement is that we're really looking to make sure that young folks are either in the care of a parent, and we're seeing that overwhelmingly when we go out there, there's an adult with them, um, or young folks are making their way home. We also ask young folks if um, they need assistance with um, making a phone call to get home. Um, and then finally, offering young folks the opportunity to come to a, a connection center. It is worth sharing with you all that in the two weekends that we've been doing this work, no juveniles in our city have been shot on those weekends, either fatally or non-fatally. And when we compare this period to last year, um, that wasn't the case. We saw two young people last year um, be shot last weekend non-fatally, um, and one of them shot fatally. In the two weeks this year, leading up to the implementation of this, we also saw four young people get shot non-fatally. And so while we have never said that this was going to solve all of our youth violence, the mayor's been really clear when he's articulated that this is a part of the larger picture. I appreciate that. I would love, uh, as a follow-up request, um, the, the data regarding the number of interactions, uh, number of young people going to youth centers, um, and I, I would say specifically, because we talked about this in the hearing before, but um, the number of people who, who the folks in vans have been interacting with and how that's gone, would love to have that as a follow-up. Uh, can I offer something there? Sure. Uh, so I actually worked uh, Memorial Day weekend, I think each day of curfew, so Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Mm -hmm. um, and just some of my observations, the first night um, I worked at the curfew center with the mayor. The second night I did outreach um, with some of our partners at Monsey um, at the Inner Harbor. And then the third evening um, was actually at um, the Be More Lit, our youth engagement event. 
Um, and what I can tell you is doing um, that outreach at the Inner Harbor, we touched dozens of young people. I probably spoke to at least 40 young people that night myself. Um, and what I will tell you is that young people were very receptive. Um, we actually encouraged young people to come back to the Inner Harbor the very next day um, because we had a free event for, um, for young people. And that event probably netted over 350 young people that came out and really enjoyed themselves for Memorial Day weekend. Um, so what, my rationale for talking to you about kind of my experience in that first weekend is really to, to paint the picture of, of the overarching strategy. This is not just about a center, nor is it about vans, right? Um, this is a pretty comprehensive strategy that not only pairs um, street outreach with social workers that are in vehicles as well as are um, at curfew centers, but we're also deeply investing um, in fun and exciting and supportive events for our young people throughout the summer as well. And we have to take this strategy in totality. We can't parse out specific pieces of the strategy um, because it is meant to be a comprehensive and cohesive strategy that connects um, accountability um, with um, other fun and engaging opportunities. And quite frankly, I think we were able to see the numbers um, that we saw on that Sunday because of the outreach that we did the night before in, in a harbor in Fells Point and, and neighborhoods across the city. I agree with you a million percent. And um, I didn't want to ask for a whole bunch of things. So, <laughs> but I, I would say like, I, for me to understand the program, I'd want to understand all the outreach that happens and the, and the multiple ways that we reached out to get the word out. Um, then day of, like how many people we interacted with day of, if there were any changes in the following nights, so on and so forth, uh, we can put that, in. if we already have that data, and can easily put that into a request. I would love it. I think it would tell us a lot about this operation so that when we consider something like it in the future, we know whether or not it was worthwhile. Um, but yeah, I agree with you 100%. Um, uh, and um, Mr. Chair is gonna kill me. Um, I, I told him I was done. I, just one more, um, and I'm curious, I'll be very brief, uh, about um, the Safe Routes to School program and uh, to and from school. Just tell me a little bit about that. And similar to this, how we're thinking about success. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I, I would offer that uh, this committee knows that while uh, we have seen um, significant reductions in gun violence across our city, um, that that's juxtaposed against um, an uptick in violence that we were seeing um, committed either by or against our young people. And so it is with that in mind that back in January, February, that the mayor pulled um, Monsi, the mayor's office of children and family success, a whole host of other agencies in partnership with Baltimore City Public Schools, MTA police together for us to have discussions, not only about how we, how we identify high risk um, young folks, um, but also um, took a recommendation that we brought to him around the implementation of what we, we're calling safe passage. And safe passage um, is just that. How do we make sure that our young folks are able to get to and from school uh, safely without altercation? Um, the data that we were looking at at the time back in February and March indicated that our, our young people were most at risk between the hours of 7 a.m. and 3 a.m. That's time when you're supposed to be going to school, in school, or on your way home. Um, in partnership with MTA, we did collect data um, that told us where we needed to start first. And the issues um, that occur in our major transit hubs are what drove us to designate Mondawmin and State Center first. We saw over 50% of our student-related incidents happening at Mondawmin. I'm sure many, many members of this committee have seen flyers on social media or been shared um, those flyers with regard to link ups um, at Mondawmin. Happy to say that since we implemented safe passage um, on the 30th as we return back from Memorial Day that MTA police has reported to us that there have been no student related incidents at either one of those travel hubs. And so over the summer, we will be looking to um, explore what the next five priority areas should be based on data. Um, and then implementing the same work there. The beauty of this is that it's not just about MTA police or school police, but it's also school administrators um, and teachers. So it's folks who um, our students are familiar with going to these transit hubs in addition to community-based partners. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Thank you, colleagues. Any other questions? Seeing as there's none, um, Nina, can you um, you have the spreadsheet open? Can you come up to the to one of the microphones and please read to me all the requests from Monsi this evening? I think there's six or seven on there. Mr. Chair, I do have the answer to your question from earlier. If you'd like that now, uh, I'm not sure which question, but please and thank you. So you asked what the time period was that we were measuring the 25.4. Four. 25.24%. It's a January 1, 2021 through May 31st, 2022 comparison against January 1, 2022 against May 31st, 2023. So the same period there. Um, and then. Um, we're, we're double counting the period of January 1st, 2022 through May X of 2022, but okay. Thank you, though. I, I appreciate the clarification. And then you asked about the increase in the Western District, and it does appear that the homicides are currently up 21%. Thank you. Nina? Sure. Okay, so we'll start at the top. We have a request from the chair to provide the document that outlines what the full staffing build out for Monzi should be through 2026. Mm hmm. Uh, next up from Councilman Conway, explanation of the 100 victims served um, target in fiscal 23. Uh, next from Chair Costello, provide the timeline of comparison, what dates were compared to get a 25.4%, 2%, and 33.8% reduction. Yep, still like that in writing, please, and thank you. Keep going. Okay. Um, from Councilmember Ramos, neighborhood policing plan RFA through ARPA. Uh, next up, Chairman Costello, is money available for the camera rebate program within BCIT? And how much? Please and thank and you. how much? For, for fiscal 24. Okay. Next up from Councilman Conway, outcome metrics for neighborhood stabilization responses. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then again with Councilman Conway, data requests provide total number of interactions with youth. And that's for the UDH Got it. Colleagues, did we miss anything? Director, I want to thank you and your team for being here with us late this evening. I'm going to close out with one comment. Um, this issue around data and how we present data is of concern to me. And I think oftentimes data can be provided in various different contexts. I want to be clear with the administration and with Monsi moving forward that every time that data is presented, which is used to justify policy decisions around anything related to public safety, I'm going to be asking these same questions. And I think it's a reasonable expectation for the legislative branch to have that that data is presented in a way that, that tells the entire context. Because when we started the hearing, we're told, you know, this 25% reduction, 24% reduction, and that's a, that's a great story, that is. But what's not a great story is a 21% increase in homicides in the Western in the same catchment area. And I don't wanna debate the, the, the merits of it either way. I'm, I'm not passing judgment on it. I'm just saying that data needs to be presented in a way that provides the, the entire context moving forward, the time frame for which um, that data is, is being presented moving forward. Director, again, to you and your team, thank you all for being here. CAE Leach, Laura, your team, government relations team, council president's team, thank you. Uh, we're now in recess till 9 a.m. tomorrow. Get home safe, everyone.